Patricia Schmidt, who went by Susie, lived with her family in Seacliff, south of Adelaide in South Australia. In December of 1971, 16-year-old Susie had just finished her leaving exam at Seacombe High School a few weeks earlier. Susie dreamed of one day becoming an airline hostess. For the time being, she had taken a job at the Burger King in Darlington so that she would have money to buy Christmas presents for her family. Susie's 10-year-old brother, Frank, had already gotten her a present, which sat wrapped under the family Christmas tree. Tragically, Susie never got to open it. Susie had decided to start requesting late-night shifts because they offered better pay. Friday, December 17, 1971, was only the second such shift she worked. That evening, Susie's father, Werner, dropped her off at the home of her friend Frida around 6 p.m. when he was on his way to the local German club, where he worked part-time as a barman. Around 8.30, Susie and Frida walked to the Burger King so that Susie could start her shift. Before Frida left so that Susie could start working, Susie told her that she would see her the next day. Susie finished work around 1.45 a.m. on December 18th. Her father was supposed to pick her up on his way home, but he was running 10 minutes late. Susie decided to walk home rather than wait any longer. Describing his brief delay, Werner Schmidt would later tell the press, a few minutes could have made all the difference. I might have saved my daughter's life. Susie never arrived home, and Werner reported her missing at 9.30 that morning, less than eight hours after she was last seen at work. Around 6.30 that evening, an off-duty police officer was driving in Hallett Cove when he thought he saw something amongst the tall grass along the road. When he got closer, he realized it was the body of a young woman. It was Susie Schmidt. When Susie was found, she was wearing only her boots. Her bra was found hanging from a nearby fence, and her jumper and coat had been draped over her body. The kangaroo skin purse she had been carrying was never located. Evidence showed that Susie had been sexually assaulted prior to being murdered, and the battered state of her body showed that she had died a violent death. Susie was buried next to her mother, who had passed away five years earlier. Police believed Susie may have accepted a ride home from her killer. She told a friend that on Tuesday, December 14th, after she worked her first night shift, she had accepted a ride from an unattractive man who was around 30 years old and had severe acne. After Susie got into his car, he suggested that they take a drive to the Adelaide Hills, but Susie said no. He then began driving towards Hallett Cove, but Susie demanded that he drive her home, which he ultimately did. It is unclear if police believe this same man could have potentially given Susie a ride home on the night of her murder, or if he could have been involved in her killing. They cannot say for sure if she willingly accepted a ride or if she was abducted as she walked home. Authorities did have several clues to go on at the scene. They found metal filings from key cutting, microscopic particles that could have been from a shoe repair business, byproducts left behind by welding, particles of electric waste from Phillips Industries, which was located in nearby Henley Beach at the time, iridescent blue paint from a 1971 Holden Monaro, and small paint flakes that were pink on one side and white on the other. Following up on these clues did not immediately lead to the case being solved. It would be decades before investigators could properly use additional evidence found at the crime scene. DNA from multiple men. In December of 2021, South Australia police launched a new appeal for information on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Susie's murder. They also announced a recent major breakthrough that they believed brought them closer to solving the case than they had ever been before. DNA had been found following a new examination of Susie's clothing that had been found with her body. So far, only one of the two DNA profiles found on the clothing has been fully developed, but investigators are already using it to try to identify one of the at least two men responsible for the sexual assault. 
The profile was uploaded to the National DNA Database, but no direct match was found. Investigators then turned to familial searching, which has so far identified eight potential relatives of the suspect. Despite this strong new evidence, the process of building family trees and testing all potential matches will take some time. Police are still hoping for witnesses to come forward with the name of a potential suspect so they can do a direct DNA test, which could potentially allow them to solve the case within a few weeks. A reward of up to $1 million is being offered. For Susie's brother, Frank, the new developments have given him hope that the case will finally be resolved after decades of waiting. He stated, you know, you're better off having some hope and being disappointed than no hope at all. Friday, October 29th, 1993, was a full day of fun for the students at Eureka Elementary School in Granite Bay, California, as they celebrated Halloween. They went from classroom to classroom trick-or-treating and had a fall festival. After the day's festivities concluded and the students went home, fifth grade teacher Sherilyn Hawkley stayed late to clean up from the celebration. She was seen cleaning up popcorn around 4.30 p.m and the school's janitor saw that her minivan was still in the parking lot at 5.30. When he went out to the parking lot again around 6, the minivan was gone. Sherilyn never arrived home, however, and her boyfriend quickly became concerned. He went to the school to look for her, but did not find her there. He called Sherilyn's family to see if they had heard from her before reporting her missing. It would not be until the day of the holiday she had just been celebrating with her students, Halloween, that Sherilyn would be located. That night, a deputy out on patrol saw Sherilyn's Dodge Caravan minivan pulled off of East Roseville Parkway in a wooded area. The location was less than a mile away from the school where Sherilyn taught and had last been seen. Curiously, it was in within view of another school, Oak Hills Elementary. Sherilyn's body was discovered in the vehicle's back seat. She was just 39 years old. At the time of her death, Sherilyn had been going through a period of major change. She had applied for the position at Eureka Elementary after going through a divorce. She and her ex-husband had been married for 15 years and had three children together, two daughters and a son. Sherilyn's daughter, Heather, who was just 14 years old at the time of her mother's death, would later describe Sherilyn as the best mother ever. Sherilyn was loving and full of life. She and Heather shared a love of Whitney Houston and would blast her music when they were in the car or at home cleaning, singing or lip syncing along to their favorite songs. Sherilyn's loving nature, which made her such a great mother, also helped her quickly endear herself to her students. Heather was proud of her mother for being hired for the position at Eureka Elementary because so many people had applied for it, and Sherilyn was overjoyed to have been selected for the job. When interviewed even decades later, the students who had been in her class enthusiastically recalled what a great teacher she was. Sherilyn's autopsy found that she had died as the result of ligature strangulation. She was found partially clothed, but tests to determine if she had been sexually assaulted were inconclusive. Authorities believed that she was killed the night she was last seen, the 29th. Robbery did not appear to be the motive for the murder, as her purse and several other personal items were still inside the van. Sherilyn's boyfriend and ex-husband were investigated but quickly ruled out as suspects in the case, as were Sherilyn's co-workers at the school. However, investigators do not believe that Sherilyn was killed by a stranger. When the case first started, there was definitely a sense that it was probably somebody who at least knew her, somebody familiar with the area, and to a large extent, that remains true today. Placer County Sheriff's Detective Brian Madison stated in 2016, 
There were reported sightings of an unknown individual sitting in a Volkswagen Beetle at Sherilyn School on October 29th, but following up on that lead did not produce any useful information. Authorities also considered that Sherilyn's murder may have been connected to the unsolved murder of 35-year-old Cindy Wanner, who was killed in November of 1991. Like Sherilyn, she had been strangled to death and disappeared in Granite Bay. She had been at her sister's house with her 11-month-old daughter. Her sister and brother-in-law left the home, and when Cindy's husband arrived at the house approximately 45 minutes after they left, Cindy's car, jacket, and shoes were there, but Cindy was not. Her young daughter had been left unattended but unharmed in her high chair. 19 days after she disappeared, Cindy's body was discovered by a quail hunter off of Forest Hill Road east of Auburn. She was found face down amongst some trees and was wearing only a bra, although tests to see if she had been sexually assaulted came back inconclusive. Unlike Sherilyn, who appears to have been killed the night she went missing, Cindy had been kept alive somewhere for approximately two weeks before she was murdered. In 2017, it was reported that Cindy's case was still being investigated by the Placer County Sheriff's Office and that there is a large amount of evidence available in the case. However, the Sheriff's Office is still looking for witnesses who can help them put that evidence into context to move the case forward. Investigators working on Sherilyn's case ultimately concluded, based on the differing circumstances and the different behavioral patterns between the killers in each case, that the two cases were not connected. In 2015, the Placer County Sheriff's Office began a major effort to finally solve Sherilyn's case. They resubmitted numerous pieces of evidence in the case including the rope they believe Sherilyn was strangled with, to the lab in hopes that advances in technology would provide them with new clues and potentially the DNA profile of Sherilyn's killer. While they waited on the results of the new testing, they engaged in less high-tech means of investigation as well, revisiting the scene where Sherilyn's body and her car were found, re-interviewing witnesses, and meticulously going through the thousands of pages of documents that make up Sherilyn's case file. Detective Chris Joyce stated that he believed he knew who was responsible for Sherilyn's murder in 2016 and hoped that the new testing would reveal DNA evidence that could conclusively tie that individual to the murder. Unfortunately, the renewed effort and advanced testing ultimately did not identify new evidence that led to an arrest in the case. Investigators still hope that the evidence they do have will help them secure a conviction should they be able to identify the correct suspect. They believe that Sherilyn's killer has already come up in the investigation in some capacity and they continue to work trying to identify them. A permanent memorial was created for Sherilyn at Eureka Elementary bearing the names of all the students in her class, who had all wanted to ensure that she would never be forgotten. Just after 6 p.m. on March 6th, 1974, police in Hopewell Township, Pennsylvania, received a call asking them to report to Lakewood Park. The caller had observed what they initially believed to be a mannequin in a creek running through the park. When the caller got closer, however, they realized that it was in fact the partially clothed body of a young woman lying with her face in the water of the creek. The young woman was 23-year-old Annette Tokars. According to Annette's younger sister, Sharon, Annette was exceptionally friendly. She was a very caring person who would give away the last dollar she had if someone else needed it. Annette and Sharon last spoke about a week before Annette died, and Sharon could tell that something was bothering her. Her sister did not confide in her about what was going on that was upsetting her. Injuries to Annette's body indicated that she had been assaulted prior to her death. 
A wooden club was found during the search of the park, but it was ultimately found not to have been the instrument used to cause Annette's injuries. Annette's cause of death was found to be forceful drowning. Authorities believe she had been attacked and then dragged down to the creek by her killer, who drowned her in just a few inches of water. Investigators believe she may have been unconscious when she was drowned. Police theorized that Annette had willingly gone to the park with her killer. Her autopsy showed that she had sex before her death, but it could not be determined if the sex was consensual or if Annette had been raped. Annette had been seen out in a variety of places throughout the area the night before her body was found. Police interviewed a number of witnesses to track Annette's movements in the final hours of her life. The last sighting of her was in the town of Aliquippa, just a few miles north of the park where Annette's body would eventually be found. She was last seen being driven away in the car of a man who was an acquaintance of hers. For decades, this man was considered by police to be the prime suspect in the case, although they never found enough evidence to charge him with Annette's murder. In 2022, Beaver County Detective Paul Young meticulously went over all of the evidence in Annette's case, hoping to find previously overlooked clues that could be used to further the investigation. Using an alternative light source, he located DNA evidence in what would later be described to the media as an appropriate area of Annette's clothing, opening up a possible avenue to solving the case. The DNA had degraded since 1974, and the profile that was developed from Annette's clothing was not complete enough to run through the combined DNA index system. Investigators were able to directly compare the profile to samples taken from potential suspects. The main suspect in the case, the acquaintance Annette had last been seen with, had since passed away. However, one of his relatives did provide a voluntary DNA sample. Testing on it showed that the main suspect could not have been the contributor of the DNA. The DNA was then compared to samples from a suspected local serial killer, as well as known sex offenders who were active at the time of the murder in the area. No matches were found. While the DNA profile is not complete enough to run through the criminal database, it is complete enough to attempt to use genetic genealogy to determine who the DNA belongs to. Crime Solvers of Beaver County has agreed to provide the funds for this testing. Hopefully, the effort will soon identify Annette's killer. Kainalu Higby, who also goes by Kai, was born in Maui, where his parents met. His mother is Hawaiian, and his father is Caucasian, and originally from California. Kai was seven years old when his parents' marriage ended, and following the divorce, he, his twin brother, and younger sister moved to California with their father. He grew close with his father's side of the family over the following years, but ultimately decided to return to Hawaii as a teenager. He was able to still maintain a close relationship with his family in California. In 2003, when he was 22, Kai met the woman who would become his wife, Samantha, when he pointed out to her that she had dropped a $5 bill. Samantha was instantly smitten, drawn to Kai's laid-back and fun personality. The couple got married in 2005 and had three children. They settled in a small town on Maui, and Kai began working in landscaping, becoming popular with the owners of the properties where he worked. Kai is a dedicated father who loves spending time with his children. He regularly takes them out on outdoor excursions, including hunting, spearfishing, and hiking. While Kai has a loving family, not all of the aspects of his life are as ideal. Kai has a history of substance abuse. On May 6, 2022, he relapsed after months of being clean. His wife Samantha asked him to leave the home they share, because she did not want their children to see him while he was under the influence. In previous instances when he was using, Kai would either go stay with his mother at her home in Lahaina or in a nearby rental property while he sobered up. 
His mother would be the last person to see Kai before he went missing on May 7th. Around 11.30 that night, Kai hugged his mother, gave her his phone, and told her Happy Mother's Day, which was the following day. He has not been seen since. Kai was formally reported missing on May 12th, the day his white Toyota Tacoma was found abandoned in a parking garage on Front Street near the Lahaina Harbor. The truck was sighted at that location as early as May 8th. The vehicle was left unlocked, and Kai's wallet, containing his driver's license, credit cards, and debit cards, was left on the front seat. According to Samantha, Kai abandoning the truck was highly out of character, as he is very proud of the vehicle because of how hard he worked to purchase it. Even more out of character was Kai's missing of his son's high school graduation on May 19th. Kai loved his son and had been looking forward to the event. Kai's family has become frustrated with how the Maui Police Department is handling the investigation into his disappearance. According to Samantha, the investigating officers made comments to her that she considers heartless, stating that her husband is probably off doing lots of drugs. Kai has had minor run-ins with law enforcement in the past, something his wife believes has led police to disregard his disappearance. Samantha acknowledges that her husband has made some poor choices in his life, but says that does not take away from the fact that he is a good person, and something has clearly happened to him. The family is still actively looking for Kai on their own, putting up flyers and trying to hire a private investigator. Kai's oldest son no longer sleeps in his bedroom, instead staying in the living room, waiting for his father to come home. 41-year-old Kai is six feet tall, has a number of traditional Hawaiian tattoos, and was last seen wearing a white shirt and dark-colored board shorts. Kai and his brother are identical twins, who often get confused for one another, which could potentially complicate potential sightings of Kai. Fifty-six-year-old John Lazaro lived in Rochdale, a suburb south of Brisbane. On April 11, 2012, he was in the living room of his home when two masked men burst inside and shot him multiple times. His 19-year-old daughter witnessed the shooting, but was not harmed during the attack. She was able to immediately call for help, but despite her quick action, her father did not survive his injuries. John's dog, a Rottweiler mix named Kilo, was also shot during the attack, but survived after undergoing surgery. Police would later describe John's murder as a brutal execution. While his murderers clearly targeted him, investigators could find no motive for the crime, despite interviewing more than 150 individuals in connection to their investigation. Years went on without an arrest in John's case. Police made a renewed appeal to the public for information in April of 2022, on the 10th anniversary of John's murder. At this time, they also released CCTV footage taken near John's home at the time of the murder. The footage shows a trayback utility vehicle speeding away. The footage was taken less than 100 yards away from John's home, just moments after the time he was shot. Due to how quickly the vehicle left the scene, investigators believe that at least three people were involved in the crime, the two shooters and a getaway driver. A major break in the case came just months later, in June of 2022, when authorities announced that they had located the gun used to kill John. Ballistics testing had confirmed that it was the weapon used in the case. The firearm in question was an unregistered Browning 1900 32 caliber semi-automatic. The 45-year-old man from New South Wales, who had been in possession of the gun, was questioned by authorities, and his home was searched. The weapon had been in the possession of numerous individuals since 2012, making it difficult to tie it to the person responsible for John's murder. However, Detective Acting Inspector Daniel Cunningham has stated that the discovery of the weapon has accelerated the investigation. Inquiries into the various individuals who had been in possession of the weapon are ongoing. 
When announcing the discovery of the gun, Queensland police also stated that they now believe that the shooters had ties to the Bandidos outlaw motorcycle gang. John himself was not involved with the gang. Investigators are hoping that the quickly shifting loyalties amongst gangs like the Bandidos will result in someone with information finally coming forward. There is a $500,000 reward being offered for information that ties all of the new clues and information together to finally solve John's case. In 1994, Tanya Frazier lived in the Mount Baker neighborhood in Southeast Seattle with her mother and sister. The 14-year-old tomboy was sweet and generous, always bringing joy to those around her, despite her slightly shy disposition. She was an altar server at St. Clement's Episcopal Church and spent the day of July 17th at a church picnic. She participated in potato sack races and told fellow parishioners about her new haircut. The following day, Monday, July 18, 1994, Tanya had summer classes at Mimi Middle School in the morning. She was last seen leaving the school around 11 a.m., as expected. She was then supposed to take the bus to get to her part-time job at a thrift store on Jackson Street, run by the Chicken Soup Brigade, a local nonprofit. Tanya did not arrive home at 6 p.m., as expected, so her mother, Teresa, went to the thrift store to look for her. She learned that Tanya had never arrived for her scheduled shift. Teresa then went to Meany Middle School to look for Tanya, but there was no sign of her there. Teresa contacted the police to report Tanya missing around 7.30 p.m. Police did not seem to view Tanya's disappearance as an urgent matter. They repeatedly tried to get her younger sister to say that Tanya had plans to run away from home and referred to Tanya as a runaway throughout their initial report. This was an important distinction, because while a missing child would have a detective assigned to their case, a runaway would only be assigned a community service officer. An officer spoke to two of Tanya's friends and called Teresa a few days later to ask if she had heard from Tanya. Tanya's mother did not believe her daughter had run away, both because it would have been out of character for her and because of practical considerations. If Tanya had left on her own accord, she had done so without any of her belongings or any money. At the time she disappeared, Tanya was excitedly waiting for her first paycheck from her part-time job, which she was due to receive in just a few days. She planned to use the money to buy pagers for herself and for her 12-year-old sister, Tira. Tira herself was another reason why no one who knew Tanya believed she had run away. Tira and Tanya were very close and were described as soulmates. Tanya would almost certainly never have gone anywhere without Tira and would have at least talked to her if she had any plans to leave. Tira spent the night after Tanya disappeared with her bedroom window open, just in case Tanya came home. While she could not imagine Tanya running away, the idea of something bad happening to Tanya was even more difficult to fathom. Tanya's church quickly came together to organize on Tanya's behalf when she disappeared. Corporate policies prevented them from posting flyers in many stores, but they still covered the area in over 1,500 missing persons posters. The police have a hell of a task. I want to be supportive of that. Father Ralph Karskadden, Tanya's pastor, told the media, but I also feel that had Tanya not come from our neighborhood or not been mixed race, would more people have known this terrible thing had happened to her? On July 23, 1994, Five days after Tanya went missing, a 62-year-old man was walking his dog along East Highland Drive when he noticed the smell of death. He had become familiar with that smell during his time serving during the Korean War. He stepped into a wooded area along the street and saw someone lying at the base of a tree at the bottom of a ravine. He stared at the person for several seconds before he fully processed the fact that he was looking at a human body. The body belonged to Tanya Frazier, who had been stabbed to death. The medical examiner believed she had not been killed until July 20th, two days after her disappearance. This caused fear in Tanya's mother, Teresa, that the police initially dismissing her daughter as a runaway may have resulted in her death. From the first report, 
I often wondered if they took it as more serious, if they looked in that first 24 hours. Would there have been a chance she maybe would have been saved? That's a big question, she later told the Seattle Times. Tanya's community came together to mourn her loss. A memorial was established near where her body was found, and members of her church took to the streets for walks of remembrance. It was a member of her church who donated the cemetery plot where Tanya would be buried. Tanya had a routine of picking out one of her stuffed animals to take with her on her walk to school every day. Other students now took up this habit. Tanya was last seen alive at 21st Avenue and East Thomas Street, approximately 11 blocks away from where her body would later be found. Her friends reported seeing her speaking to an unfamiliar, unkempt man. This man has so far never been identified. Despite the best efforts of her loved ones, Tanya's case received little media attention. Talking about her daughter's murder was unbearable for Teresa, but she tried to find any opportunity to do so that she could in order to keep the case in the news and hopefully reach a witness who could help solve the case. Flyers posted by Crime Stoppers generated just three calls to the tip line, none of which helped advance the investigation. Private investigator Rose Winquist began working with Tanya's family the week she went missing. She continues to work on the case and forwards every credible lead she finds to the police. Seattle Police Detective Rolf Norton, who has been the lead investigator on Tanya's case since June of 2016, says that there are numerous persons of interest in the case, none of whom will be cleared until the case is definitively solved. Despite the fact that almost 30 years have passed since Tanya's murder, her sister Tira is still hoping that one day the case will be solved. I am hopeful. I can't imagine this just never being solved and never having that closure, so I'm hopeful that it will be she said in 2023. Harvey Eugene Whitaker, who went by Jean, was born in Kokomo, Indiana on October 6, 1926. He was a very responsible and disciplined young man. He grew up on a farm with numerous siblings, with whom he was close, and worked as a typesetter for the local newspaper. He joined the army shortly after he graduated high school. He managed to rise to the rank of corporal in under two years. In the summer of 1947, 20-year-old Jean was in the Engineer Corps, assigned to the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project at the top-secret Sandia base, which was located on the outskirts of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Jean failed to report for roll call on the morning of July 1, 1947. This immediately signaled trouble to his superiors, as Jean was a dependable soldier who they could not imagine abandoning his duties. Jean did not smoke or drink, and had never gone absent without leave before. The previous evening, Jean had been at a bowling alley in Albuquerque with an army bowling league. He was an above average bowler, and because he was so trustworthy, he was made the treasurer of the league. Two days after Jean went missing, his glasses, shirt, hat, and necktie were found in an alley near the bowling alley. The shirt was bloody. Tears in the fabric indicated that Jean may have been stabbed twice in the back while he was still wearing the shirt. While some of his belongings had been found, there was still no sign of Jean himself or of his body. It was estimated that Jean had between four and $500 with him the night he vanished because of his role as a treasurer of the bowling league. However, the fact that Jean's body was not left behind, even if he had been killed during a simple robbery and his position within the military led to concerns that his disappearance may have had national security implications. The Armed Forces Special Weapons Project had taken over atomic weapons development from the Manhattan Project following World War II. Sandia was a top secret base, 
meaning Jean potentially had access to important and sensitive information. This led to fears that Jean had been abducted by someone who was hoping to extract top secret information about the base or its projects from him. Jean reportedly had done work connected to the top secret guided missile program. Spy activities had recently been discovered at the nearby base at Los Alamos. As such, the FBI joined local and military authorities in investigating the disappearance. The War Department ultimately dismissed the possibility that Jean had information worth killing for, but the FBI remained actively investigating the case for several more years. Investigators also considered the possibility that Jean had deserted. They questioned his family members and tapped their phones, hoping to find evidence of Jean contacting them. The last piece of correspondence between Jean and anyone in his family was a letter he sent to his sister Rose, but it was dated June 23rd, a week before he disappeared. Jean's bank account in Indiana was monitored, but never touched. Jean was declared legally dead in January of 1954. Many, but not all of his relatives, accepted the theory that he had been murdered during a robbery. His niece, Patty Mawson, however, believes that the circumstances surrounding her uncle's disappearance are highly suspicious and continues to work on his case to this day. She is upset that all of Jean's siblings died without knowing what happened to him and by the fact that he is still technically considered AWOL and a deserter by the Army. She has filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get files from the FBI about the case and told that approximately 200 pages from his file are available although the copies she will receive will have certain information redacted. However, she has been waiting for more than three years to receive the documents and has been told that there are 485 requests ahead of hers that have to be fulfilled first. The items of genes that were found in the alley also appear to have gone missing. They were never logged into evidence with police in Albuquerque and federal agencies do not appear to have record of where they are. In addition to getting answers about what happened to her uncle, Patty hopes to locate these items. If she cannot honor her uncle by finding his remains and giving him a proper burial, she hopes to at least bury these items so that there will be a location where Jean can be memorialized. In the summer of 2009, 28-year-old David Gimmelfarb needed some time to relax. He was working towards his doctorate degree and was about to begin his fourth year of graduate school at the Adler School of Professional Psychology in Chicago. He was also a volunteer counselor at a community health center on the west side of Chicago. While David planned to make counseling his career, it was an inherently stressful line of work. David was also coping with the recent death of his beloved grandmother, Valentina. Valentina had helped take care of David from the time he was an infant until he started kindergarten. One of David's mother's co-workers had suggested that David look into traveling to Costa Rica. It seemed like an ideal travel destination for David. He was fluent in Spanish and was an experienced hiker. The country was full of beautiful trails for him to explore. David decided that some time away in nature would do him good before he started school again, and he planned a trip to Costa Rica just a few days before he left on it. Solo travel was not out of character for David, who had gone on a similar hiking trip to Hawaii alone within the previous year. Solo travel and spending time alone in nature also fit in with David's personality, as he tended to be more introspective and reserved. These aspects of his personality may have been tied to events in his early childhood. When he started kindergarten, he struggled to speak in English with his classmates, as he was used to speaking Russian with his parents and grandmother. David became slightly less reserved later in life when he began college at Beloit College and joined a fraternity. He had a wry sense of humor and a positive outlook on life, and was skilled at writing out his thoughts about deep and philosophical topics. David began his six-day trip to Costa Rica on August 9, 2009. David was his parents' only child and was in daily contact with them, whether he was at home in Illinois or traveling. He spoke to his mother, Luda, on August 10th, 
from his room at the Hacienda Gachapelin in the Guanacosta province of northwest Costa Rica. David told her that the hotel was too far away from the beaches and most of the other area attractions he was interested in visiting, so he was considering moving to another hotel for part of his trip. He had met a girl at the beach and hoped to see her again. Luda wanted to know more about the girl, but David would only say that she seemed very nice. David told his mother that he would be spending the following day, August 11th, hiking in the nearby Rincón de la Vieja National Park. However, the following evening, he never called to tell her how his hike went, as she expected. By 10 p.m., she had grown concerned enough to try calling him, but he did not answer. She called the hotel's front desk the following morning, but they told her that he was not answering his room phone either. Luda insisted that hotel staff go into her son's room to see if he was all right. Several hours later, Luda received a phone call from the hotel's owner. It did not appear that David had slept in his room the previous night. His suitcase was still in the room, but the car he had rented had been located still in the parking lot of the National Park where David had planned to go hiking the day before. Luda and her husband, Roma, immediately made plans to travel to Costa Rica to look for their son. By the time they arrived the following day, search efforts were already underway. Volunteers from the Red Cross were searching the national park on foot. Other hikers had gone missing in the park in the past, but all of them had eventually been found. Witnesses had seen David eating breakfast at his hotel on August 11th around 9 a.m., and he signed in at the national park shortly before 10 a.m. He told the park ranger on duty that he would be hiking along an easy and established loop that was not even two miles long, but would take him past some of the thermal mud pots that were a famous feature of the park. Initial search efforts were therefore centered around this loop. However, when David was not located, search teams grew in size and rethought their strategy. Since David was an experienced hiker, they considered that he may have changed his mind and undertaken a more difficult hike. Had he done so, he potentially opted to hike up to the crater of the park's nearby volcano. This hike would take approximately eight hours to complete round trip, and sundown had been at approximately 6 p.m. on August 11th, meaning that if David had started the hike after 10 a.m., he would have been caught in the dark and could have potentially run into trouble. The crater itself was searched from the air, but nothing was found there. The expanded search area did not turn up any signs of David. While David's parents worked to find him in Costa Rica, his other loved ones back in the United States were also contributing to the search effort. A Facebook group called Help Find David Gimmelfarb was established, and more than a thousand people joined it within just a few days. David's parents were not receiving support from the American Embassy in Costa Rica, so members of the group were encouraged to contact their elected representatives to ask for government support for the search. David's friends also staged demonstrations in Chicago's Daily Plaza and outside local television stations with signs describing why David was important to them in hopes of garnering media coverage and, in turn, government support for the search effort. Their actions did finally pay off on August 19th, when the embassy sent two military helicopters equipped with infrared sensors to search the dense vegetation of the national park from the air, along with a dozen soldiers from Soto Cano Air Base in Honduras. When David was not located during the search, concerns that he may have fallen victim to something more sinister than a simple hiking accident arose. Robberies within the park were not unheard of, and sections of the park were closed down in 2009 and then later in 2012 due to visitors being robbed, reportedly by individuals wielding machetes. Because the park was close to the border with Nicaragua, some of its more remote trails were known to be used by drug smugglers and poachers to move product into the neighboring country, opening up the possibility that David may have witnessed something illegal while out hiking and was killed to prevent him from reporting what he had seen. Alternatively, David could have stumbled onto private property bordering the national park 
and been killed by a property owner who mistook David as a poacher or smuggler encroaching on their land. The proximity of the park to Nicaragua also raised the possibility for some people that David may have voluntarily disappeared and traveled there to start a new life, as the cost of living in Nicaragua is fairly low and immigration laws are not strictly enforced. However, circumstances, as well as David's behavior, do not support this theory. The night before he went missing, he had called a friend back in Chicago to confirm dinner plans they had for after he returned home. David was understandably sad about his grandmother's recent death, but he was not depressed or distressed at the time of his trip. According to messages David wrote and conversations he had shortly before he disappeared, his grandmother's death appears to have highlighted the finiteness of life for him. However, this seems to have inspired him not to despair or give up on his life, but rather to make the most out of the time he had. The items David left behind at his hotel also indicate that he was not planning on leaving for more than a day. Inside the safe in his room were his cell phone, his passport, and $600 in cash. David had traveled to Costa Rica with $800 in cash, and taking into account his expenses during his travels and at the beginning of his trip, it is estimated that he would have only had around $100 with him when he went missing. It is believed David only had his backpack, a copy of his passport, water, protein bars, his journal, an inexpensive camera, and his wallet, which contained his driver's license and a few credit cards, in addition to the presumed amount of cash, with him when he began his hike. None of David's financial accounts have been accessed since he disappeared, and there is no evidence of him opening any new ones. When David's disappearance was not quickly resolved, his parents continued to visit Costa Rica year after year to continue looking for their son. Potential clues and sightings were reported to them in the following years. A stack of crayon-drawn artwork, which bore stylistic similarities to drawings David was known to create, was found in an abandoned house in Capos, which led to the Gimmelfarbs hoping that whoever drew them had come in contact with their son and could provide them with information if they could be located. There have been several potential sightings of David since he disappeared, but none of them have been confirmed to be David. A local farmer reported seeing a disheveled hiker who ran away and into the woods when he approached him. In February of 2010, a disheveled man matching David's general description wandered in to a Coast Guard station. The man appeared confused and disoriented. Law enforcement contacted David's parents, but by the time they reached them, the man had left the station. The authorities had no legal reason to detain him. In October of 2012, an unkempt and confused man stumbled into a mini-mart in the coastal town of Limon, more than 200 miles away from the national park David visited on the day of his disappearance. The man could not talk, but gestured that he needed something to drink. A family there had seen a television report about David's disappearance and believed this man was him, so they took him to the local police station. The police met with the man, but soon let him go, without even taking a photograph of him. So there is no evidence besides the family's belief that the man was David. In 2013, while David's parents were in Costa Rica searching for David, they received calls and emails from someone telling them that David was being held hostage and would only be released if they paid a quarter of a million dollars in ransom. They were sent a photo which was supposed to be of David, but it was too dark to tell if it was actually their son. Police ultimately determined the extortion to be a hoax, as the calls the Gimmelfarbs received were found to have been made from inside of a prison. In 2018, a woman called in a tip that David may have received treatment at the National Psychiatric Hospital, but an investigator who visited the facility found no sign of anyone matching David's description. David's parents hired four private investigators to work on their son's case, both in Costa Rica and from the United States. On November 6, 2009, Costa Rica's Organismo de Investigación Judicial formally closed their investigation into David's disappearance 
despite the lack of resolution to it. As of 2018, David's case had been transferred to the agency's Department of Criminal Investigations, based out of their office in San Jose. David's parents, Roma and Luda, continued to make yearly trips to Costa Rica around the anniversary of David's disappearance to ensure David's case continues to be covered in the local media, follow up on tips, and meet with officials from the American Embassy and the OIJ about their son's case. They continued to believe that their son was still alive. In a 2018 interview, they vowed to continue making these annual trips until they were too old to travel. Unfortunately, Roma Gimmelfarb did not live to go on the next year's trip, passing away in March of 2019. He had spent four years battling cancer, but had not let it interfere with his travels to Costa Rica and his search for his son. Luda Gimmelfarb remains active in and dedicated to the search for David. A $100,000 reward is being offered for information that reveals David's whereabouts. Seventeen-year-old Yvonne Regler lived in Lorain, Ohio, and was a student at North Olmsted High School. Her best friend was her brother Dan, who was only a year apart from her in age. On August 8, 1977, Yvonne reported for work at the Sunoco gas station on Lorain Road in North Olmsted, Ohio. She was only at the station for about an hour before she was asked to work instead at a station approximately three miles away in Fairview Park. The attendant working there that morning was a mechanic, and his skills were needed at the North Olmsted station. Yvonne did not have a car, so one of her co-workers drove her to the other station. At the time, the station in Fairview Park was transitioning from being full service to self-service. On this particular day, only one gas pump was operational and was full service. At 10.30 that morning, Yvonne spoke to one of her friends on the phone. They discussed the upcoming funeral they were attending for the father of one of their friends and the dress Yvonne had purchased for the service. Despite the somber topic of conversation, the friend reported that Yvonne was in good spirits during this call. Yvonne then had another conversation over the phone about the funeral, this time with one of her family members at 11 a.m. The manager at the North Olmsted station dropped off lunch for Yvonne at noon. And half an hour later, two teenage girls saw her at the gas station. Yvonne spoke to her friend on the phone again sometime between 12.30 and 1 p.m. The friend could hear the service bell ding over the line, and Yvonne told them that a car had driven through but left the station. The friend heard the bell sound again, and Yvonne told them that the same car was back. Yvonne then said that she would call the friend again after her shift ended at 3 o'clock. Yvonne initialed the receipt when a customer used a credit card to buy gas at 1.25 p.m. Between 1.30 and 2.05, three people, two customers and a coffee machine repairman, came into the station and found no one there. They were not alarmed, however, and did not contact police. The employee who came to take over for Yvonne when her shift ended was alarmed, however, when he arrived at 2.45. Yvonne was nowhere to be found, but her purse, partially eaten lunch, cigarettes, and book were still there. He called over to the North Olmsted station, and the manager, who had seen Yvonne less than three hours earlier, rushed over to help look for her. When he and the other employee could not find her, they called police at 3.30. There were no signs of a struggle inside the station, and there was still $300 in cash in the register. Police theorized that Yvonne had been abducted while she was outside, potentially when she had gone out to pump a customer's gas. More than 100 tips were investigated in the following years. Local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies were involved in the investigation. Numerous persons of interest were identified, but without finding Yvonne or her body, police could only theorize about what had potentially been done to her. Years and then decades passed without any answers in the case. The passage of time did not diminish Yvonne's family's desire for answers. In 2014, one of her family members asked to provide a DNA sample so that Yvonne's remains could be identified. 
should they ever be located. This led to a renewed effort by authorities in the investigation. Police went back and re-interviewed all of the witnesses in the case. In 2016, on the 39th anniversary of Yvonne's disappearance, the Fairview Park Police Department announced that during this process, they had identified a potential person of interest in the case. This man was known to police and had previously been connected to crimes of a similar nature to Yvonne's case. Police made this news public in hopes of encouraging new witnesses to come forward with tips that could potentially help them confirm or refute this individual's involvement in Yvonne's disappearance. The effort did not result in the case being solved. In 2021, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released an age-progressed image of what Yvonne may look like at the age of 62. Everyone is doing what they need to be doing on the police side. On my side, all I can do is hope that there will be closure, Yvonne's brother Dan said in 2022. Susan Morrissey Ledyard was always reading at least two books at any given time. Her love of reading began when she was young and became a constant in her life that ultimately influenced numerous aspects of her adult life. Susan was naturally brilliant, to the point where her siblings found her intelligence to be always admirable, but sometimes intimidating. She did not mindlessly scan the books she read, instead easily absorbing the material and consistently learning new things. She extensively highlighted passages and made notes in the books in her collection. Susan did not become lost in the books she read, instead using what she learned from them to follow her passions and benefit others. She had a deep compassion and concern for others, whether or not they were human. She became a vegetarian at the age of eight out of concern for animals. And as an adult, she campaigned to save sea lions in San Francisco. She was well-versed in both national and international issues from a young age and remained highly politically aware and active throughout her life. While she was aware of and concerned about the variety of issues facing people across the United States and around the world, Susan never lost sight of those who were closest to her. She cared deeply about the well-being of the most important people in her life, particularly her brother and two sisters. Her family valued her complexity and the depth of her knowledge, and she drew attention from even mere acquaintances because she was so obviously an interesting person to speak with. Susan ultimately incorporated her love of language and literature into her career working as a teacher for over 20 years. She was drawn to teaching English and language arts at the high school level because working with older students allowed her to fully and deeply dive into literature and explore language with them. She was very popular with her students because she made them feel confident in expressing their own opinions and viewpoints on the books they were studying rather than demanding a standard response. Susan's career as an educator had taken her to numerous places before she arrived at Academy Park High School in Sharon Hill, Pennsylvania, where she would teach for 13 years. She taught English for a year in Prague and then went on to earn her master's degree and teach in California for a number of years. Despite her travels, Susan's favorite place did not change. She felt the most like herself at the beaches of Stone Harbor, New Jersey, spending time with her family at her mother's home there. Susan's sister Meg would bring her family from California to the house at the shore for three weeks every July, and since Susan was off work for the summer, she was able to spend almost the entirety of their trip there with them. In 2019, that trip to the shore ended on July 20th for Susan, and she returned to the home she shared with her husband, Ben Ledyard, in Wilmington, Delaware. Just three days later, on July 23rd, at approximately 7.30 a.m., Susan's body was discovered in the Brandywine River, near Northeast Boulevard in Wilmington. A short time later, her black 2016 Honda Civic was found parked on Walker's Mill Road, near the Rising Sun Lane Bridge, 
approximately three miles upriver from where Susan's body had been found. Susan's body was taken to the State Division of Forensic Science to determine her cause and manner of death. Investigators stated early on that they did not believe Susan's death had been a suicide, although they could not comment further about what had caused her death without the full results from her post-mortem examination. Susan's loved ones initially believed her death had been an accident, largely because they could not imagine anyone wanting to harm her. Susan's husband, Ben, told her sister, Missy, that the evening before Susan's body was found, he had gone to the movies with a friend. Susan was sitting on their porch, drinking wine and sending texts, when he and his friend arrived home. The friend remained at the house for a brief time before going home. Susan called and texted friends and family members for the next several hours. She was having a conversation with her sister Missy over text until 12.30 a.m. on July 23rd. According to Missy, there was nothing unusual about their conversation. Susan continued calling and texting friends until 2.45 a.m. The friends she was texting during this time were all ones she had made while living in California. So while it was almost 3 a.m. on the East Coast, it was only approaching midnight for her friends on the West Coast. Susan being up so late and sending so many texts was perfectly normal behavior for her during the summer months. During the school year, she was dedicated to her students and kept a schedule that allowed her to get enough sleep to be ready for the early mornings she had for school. When school was not in session, however, Susan would regularly stay up late to focus more on spending time with her friends and family or communicating with them. What was unusual about Susan's behavior that night is the fact that she then left home. Her reason for leaving remains unknown. There is no record of her contacting someone and agreeing to meet with them. And while Susan occasionally smoked cigarettes in the evenings, her family does not believe that she would have left home at three in the morning to purchase them. Even if she had, she traveled in the opposite direction of the nearest place where she could buy them at that time of night. Authorities were able to use Susan's cell phone records as well as surveillance footage to determine that her vehicle had pulled out of her driveway at 3.02 a.m. Two minutes later, it was parked on Walker's Mill Road, where it would be located later that morning after Susan's body was found. Since Susan's home was only about a mile away, it appears that the car was driven straight from the home to Walker's Mill Road. Because of the darkness of the surveillance footage and the distance of the cameras from the car, no one can be seen getting out of the car. No one can be seen getting out of the car after it was parked, and it cannot be determined if Susan was the person driving the car or if anyone else was in the car with her. One detail been provided also gave a potential explanation for Susan leaving the house and a possible contributing factor to what was originally believed to be her accidental death. According to Ben, as he was going up to bed, he and Susan both took sleep aids they had been prescribed. For Susan, that sleep aid was Ambien. In May of 2019, the Food and Drug Administration issued a warning about Ambien and several similar drugs after patients taking them began experiencing dangerous side effects. While these side effects are very rare, they have resulted in injury and death. The FDA found 66 cases in which patients who took this category of drug unknowingly engaged in dangerous activities like sleepwalking or driving while not fully awake. 46 of these incidents involved serious but non-fatal injuries, like burns and the loss of limbs. 20 of them resulted in the patient's death, caused by accidental drowning, falls, hypothermia, and carbon monoxide poisoning. No matter how unusual these severe side effects are, if Susan had taken Ambien, it opened up the possibility that she had been experiencing some of them leading up to her death. If she had not been fully awake, it could explain why she left her house for no identifiable reason, and she could have accidentally gone into the water after she parked her car. However, problems with this theory were identified quickly after Susan's death. 
The terrain between where Susan parked her car and the river would have made it very difficult for Susan to make it directly down to the water, especially at night and while she was theoretically impaired. Additionally, despite the proximity of Susan's car to the river, authorities quickly came to the realization that Susan most likely did not go into the river near where the vehicle was parked. That stretch of the river had exposed rocks due to low water levels and other obstructions that would have prevented her body from continuing down the river to where it was ultimately discovered. Susan most likely went into the water, closer to where her body was ultimately located. Furthermore, Susan's death did not occur immediately after she left her home. Susan wore a Fitbit, which recorded activity and a heartbeat until around 7 a.m., four hours after Susan left home and half an hour before her body was discovered. Unfortunately, this model did not have a GPS system, meaning it could not be used to track Susan's movements. Susan's cell phone had been found inside her purse, which had been left inside of her car, and therefore it also could not be used to determine where Susan went during this period of time when her location and activities remain unaccounted for. The theory that Susan had experienced an adverse reaction to Ambien was fully discredited when her toxicology report was finalized. The report showed that she did have some alcohol in her system at the time of her death, but no Ambien or any illegal drugs. The theory that Susan's death was the result of an accident was also disproven a few months after she passed away. In early October, authorities informed Susan's family that the Delaware Division of Forensic Science had ruled that Susan's death had been a homicide. They found that the cause of her death had been blunt force trauma and drowning. Due to their ongoing investigation, the Delaware State Police have not disclosed the exact nature of Susan's injuries or where they were located on her body. These findings were made public on November 14, 2019. As confusing as the four-hour gap between the time Susan left her house and the time she was killed is, it does offer a wider window of opportunity for witnesses to have seen her. Since Susan's death, her family has organized efforts that have distributed thousands of flyers in the area where her body was found hoping that witnesses with information that could potentially identify Susan's killer will come forward. While the exact location where Susan entered the river has not been identified, the general area along the river has parks and condo buildings where early morning dog walkers and joggers may have seen Susan or something suspicious on the morning of July 23, 2019. Susan was five feet, four inches tall weighed 130 pounds, and was wearing a purple tank top at the time she was killed. Susan's family has partnered with Crime Stoppers to offer a $50,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest in the case. The Morrissey family is also preserving Susan's memory and her teaching legacy through the establishment of the Susan Morrissey Foundation. A major focus of the foundation is the Susan Morrissey Ledyard Prize for Achievement in English, a partial scholarship awarded to students from the high school where Susan was teaching at the time of her death, who excel in the subject of English. The foundation awarded its first scholarship to one of Susan's former students in 2021. Two additional students from Academy Park High School received scholarships in 2022. While Susan's family has found some comfort in honoring her legacy through the foundation, they struggle greatly with her death and the lack of answers in her case. Losing Susan and not knowing who is responsible for her murder has dramatically changed their lives individually, as well as their dynamic as a family. The Morrissey family has asked that anyone with information, no matter how insignificant it may seem, report it to police so that they can evaluate its importance. Even the smallest detail could potentially lead to the identification of Susan's killer.
29-year-old Vita Lou Powers was a dependable employee of St. Thomas West Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee, and the dedicated mother of two children. She was very close with her family and was always willing to help them. Vita began May 26, 1982 as normal, sticking to her usual routine. She left her home on 9th Avenue South and dropped her children off at daycare. She then drove over to her sister's house to pick her up and give her a ride to her job at the Continental Insurance Office. It was at this point in the morning where Vita began deviating from her routine. During the drive to the insurance office, Vita told her sister that she had taken the day off from work, so instead of driving to the hospital after dropping her off, she would be going home and going back to bed. Vita's sister would be the last known person to see her. Vita did not pick up her children from daycare that afternoon, which was unheard of for her. Her family was notified, and the search for her quickly began. She was not at home, and neither was her car, in orange 1975 Chevrolet Monza. A formal police report was taken on May 28th, and police joined the search. Vita's car was located on May 30th, abandoned on 14th Street South near Edge Hill Avenue, just a few blocks away from her home. According to police, the location was unusual, and it appeared that someone had tried to conceal the car so that it would not be found right away. Vita's purse and eyeglasses were found inside the vehicle. This was concerning, because Vita had very poor eyesight and relied heavily on her glasses. The glasses being left behind led police to believe that foul play was involved in Vita's disappearance. Police do have a person of interest in the case, but not enough evidence to conclusively tie him to Vita's disappearance. The month of May continues to be difficult for Vita's two children, because it marks the anniversary of her disappearance, as well as her birthday and Mother's Day. Vita's daughter, Yolanda, who was just nine years old when her mother went missing, continues to search for her mother and hopes that anyone who knew her mother at the time she vanished, or has even the smallest piece of information, will come forward. I'm just keeping it positive. Every day, the Lord wakes me up is a day for me to try and find her, Yolanda said in 2023. Helene Anderson, who went by Nikki, was born on October 15, 1958, in South Bend, Indiana. At the beginning of 1986, 27-year-old Nikki was living in a duplex at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac in Bremerton, Washington, and working at a nearby Arby's restaurant. She shared the home on Magnolia Drive with her two children, four-year-old Adrian and seven-month-old Marcus. Adrian's father, Kenny Hale, has described his daughter as a gift from God, with a charming smile and a strong personality, even at her young age. He says she was a very advanced child who could spell her name when she was just two years old. Kenny and Nikki's relationship had not worked out, but they remained in each other's lives because of their love for their daughter. They co-parented Adrian together very well and regularly spent time together with her. In January of 1986, Nikki was engaged to the father of her son. Her fiancé was serving in the United States Navy and was stationed in San Diego. She was in the process of packing up her home in preparation of moving to California to be near him. Adrian would be staying in Washington with Kenny for a period of time while her mother got settled in California before joining her there. Kenny was at Nikki's home on the evening of January 29th spending time with Adrian after he got off of work. When the time came for Kenny to leave, Adrian asked him if she could spend the night at his house. He thought about bringing her home with him, but ultimately told his daughter no, because he did not want Adrian to have to wake up extra early so that he could bring her back to Nikki's house so as to keep her on her usual schedule. He told Adrian he would see her the next day before he left for the evening. Adrian waved to him from the house's front window as he left. Kenny returned to the home on Magnolia Drive the following evening, as planned. He was surprised when there was no answer when he knocked on the front door. Disappointed, he turned around to leave. However, as he did, he could hear Nikki's son Marcus whimpering inside the house. 
Concerned, he tried the front door and found that it was unlocked. He had trouble fully opening the door as something inside was blocking the door's path. Kenny tripped over something as he entered the home. When he reached down, he grabbed something stiff. His heart dropped when he realized he was holding his daughter's leg. It was dark inside the home, but Kenny could see Adrian lying on the floor near the front door and Nikki lying further inside the home. Kenny grabbed baby Marcus, who was in a playpen just feet away from his mother, and ran next door to the neighbor's home to get help. While the neighbor called police, Kenny ran back to Adrian. Not knowing how long she had been there, he frantically began performing CPR on his daughter. Tragically, his efforts could not save his little girl. It would later be determined that Adrian and Nikki had been dead, and baby Marcus had been alone in the home with their bodies for approximately 20 hours. Nikki and Adrian had both been strangled to death. In addition, Nikki had suffered blows to the back of her head. Defensive wounds showed that she had fought fiercely against her killer. She had been sexually assaulted, which police believed was the motive for her murder. Robbery did not appear to be a motive, as valuables that were out in plain sight had been left behind. Adrian had been found in her pajamas, with the comforter from her bed near her. Investigators theorized that she had been woken up by the noise created by the struggle of the killer attacking her mother, and she had come into the living room to see what was going on. Based on where her body was found, she appears to have tried to escape the house, with the killer catching her just before she reached the front door. Police believed she was killed because she saw her mother's killer and was old enough to potentially identify him. Police theorized that seven-month-old Marcus was not killed because he was not old enough to describe or identify the killer. The killer placed Marcus in a playpen, along with a cushion he removed from a nearby couch. Nikki's neighbor on the other side of the duplex says she did not hear anything the night of the murders. Normally, she could hear everyday noises through their shared wall, but she heard no screams or a struggle that night. She later said that she had an ear infection at the time, which may have impacted her hearing. She did hear Marcus crying throughout the day following the murders, but assumed it was just his normal cries for food or a fresh diaper. Two other witnesses in the neighborhood reported hearing one scream the night of the murders, but nothing else. Numerous people had come to the home looking for Nikki on January 30th, including an acquaintance, a co-worker, and a furniture salesman. Some of them came to the home multiple times, but no one tried to open the front door until that evening, when Kenny Hale heard Marcus crying. Nikki's fiance was confirmed to have been on duty at his naval base in San Diego at the time of the murders, eliminating him as a potential suspect. While Kenny Hale did have an alibi for the time of the murders as well, he remained under suspicion in the early days of the investigation. Police were skeptical of the peaceful co-parenting relationship he had with Nikki, viewed her upcoming move as a potential motive, and knew Kenny had regular access to the home. Kenny wanted to do whatever he could to help with the investigation, and was shocked when he realized he was being considered as a suspect. His sister told him he should hire a lawyer soon after the murders. Kenny did not see how this would be necessary, but took her advice, which quickly proved to be a wise decision when he was aggressively questioned by police. Kenny agreed to undergo a voluntary polygraph examination, but his lawyer terminated the exam halfway through it, pointing out that Kenny was still too emotionally distraught for the results of the examination to be accurate. According to Kenny, after he walked out of the police station that day, it would be a decade before he heard anything more from police. The case soon went cold, with police following up on all the leads they could initially identify within the first six to eight months of the investigation. Authorities identified a handful of potential suspects, including the boyfriend of Nikki's aunt, a neighbor who had babysat Adrian, and a man whose car was seen in the neighborhood that night, but none of them could be tied to the murders. The case was reopened by police in 1993, 
2003, 2009, and 2019. But the renewed efforts have so far not led to any arrests. In the later efforts, Kenny Hale was contacted by investigators and made aware of their ongoing efforts. There is one major clue in the case, but authorities have so far been unable to use it to identify the killer. DNA evidence, believed to be from the killer, was found at the scene. The exact source of the DNA has not been publicly disclosed. Bremerton police detective Marty Garland, who has most recently been overseeing the investigation, has stated that it is unclear if the sexual assault against Nikki was, in his words, completed. A local newspaper reported in 2010 that a drop of blood that did not belong to either Nikki or Adrian had been found on Adrian's nightgown, but this has not been confirmed as the source of the DNA. Unfortunately, wherever the DNA came from, it has proven to be of limited use to the investigation. Despite advanced testing, the DNA profile that was developed is not complete. It is not a complete enough profile for investigators to be allowed by law to run it through criminal databases or use genetic genealogy to identify the killer. The only option investigators have is to directly compare it to samples taken from suspects they are able to identify. All of the men known to have been close to Nikki, including Kenny Hale, have been tested and eliminated as a contributor of the DNA. There were no signs of forced entry into Nikki's house. Investigators do not believe she would have opened her door to someone she did not know in the middle of the night since no one known to be associated with her has been a match to the DNA. Investigators theorize that the killer was known by Nikki well enough for her to open her door for them, but not so well that he could be identified by the other people in her life. When he was contacted by different detectives over the years, Kenny Hale did not feel particularly optimistic about their efforts. When Detective Garland took over the case and contacted him, however, Kenny felt differently. Detective Garland has looked into numerous potential avenues of investigation in the case in recent years. He has conducted further DNA testing, investigated known serial killers, and even explored the possibility of having Nikki's son Marcus, who was just seven months old at the time of the murders, undergo hypnosis. He believes he is close to solving the case, if he can just track down the right individual to compare the DNA from the crime scene to. Nikki's son Marcus is now in his 30s and lives in Mississippi, where his father, Nikki's fiance at the time of her murder, also lives. Kenny Hale still struggles with the loss of his daughter and with remembering the brutal end to her young life. He has albums full of pictures he took of her but sometimes he cannot look through them in their entirety because he becomes too emotional. While his relationship with Nikki did not work out, he still describes her as a beautiful person who did not deserve her violent death and hopes to get justice for her as well. As painful as revisiting the murders is for him, he will not give up on his daughter and her mother or on finally getting answers in their case. It gets kind of hard to go back and relive the story, he told the Daily Beast in 2022. But as long as I got air in my lungs and am able to tell their story, I'll keep telling their story until I can't tell it no more. Jason Knapp was a native of York, Pennsylvania. He was hardworking and smart. He was also a perfectionist from a young age, once crying for three days because he got a bad grade on a test in elementary school. As he got older, his commitment to excellence quickly paid off. He played three sports in high school and had lots of friends, to whom he was very loyal. He was accepted into the mechanical engineering program at Clemson University in South Carolina. He was a member of the ROTC, and in 1998, 20-year-old Jason was pledged into the National Society of Pershing Rifles, a national military honor society. 
His hobbies also required a great amount of skill, as he enjoyed target shooting and mountain biking. Jason normally called back home to speak to his mother, Deborah, in Pennsylvania every day. During their call on Saturday, April 11th, 1998, he told her about his induction into the Pershing Rifles and how he and a friend had been out looking for an apartment. This would be the last time Deborah spoke to her son. Deborah did not get any calls from her son in the next few days, which was unusual, but she assumed he was busy studying in preparation for the end of the semester and making arrangements for his housing in the following school year. On April 17th, Deborah finally received a phone call, but it was not from Jason. It was from one of his roommates, informing her that no one had seen Jason all week. The last time anyone had seen Jason was the day he last spoke to his mother, Saturday, April 11th. That evening, his roommate had seen him watching a movie in their apartment. When Deborah learned of this, she immediately called police in South Carolina to report her son missing. Police officers checked local hospitals and searched Jason's apartment. The following day, Deborah and her ex-husband, Jason's father, John, traveled from Pennsylvania to South Carolina to help look for their son. On April 21st, Jason's white 1990 Chevrolet Beretta was reported to police as being parked at Table Rock State Park in Pickens, South Carolina, approximately 30 miles away from his college campus. According to the park superintendent, they had not contacted the police earlier, despite the fact that the car had been there since April 12th, because there was a trail within the park that took a full week to complete. Since there was a sticker on Jason's car indicating that he was an ROTC, park staff had assumed he would have had interest in hiking such a long trail, and the physical strength and skills needed to complete it. Even when the car remained untouched after a week, they believed that its owner may have been too tired to drive after completing the long hike, and had gotten a ride home, and planned to come back for the car at a later time. When the car was still there on the ninth day, however, they became concerned and notified the authorities, who quickly connected the car to the active missing persons case. Authorities believe Jason entered the park between 3 and 5 p.m. on Sunday, April 12th, the day after his last phone conversation with his mother. His fingerprints were found on the park ticket, so they do believe Jason was the person who drove his car to the location. Table Rock State Park consists of thousands of acres, and much of it is wilderness. An extensive search was launched in the park, and a nearby lake was drained. No signs of Jason were found despite the massive effort, which took more than two weeks. Police say there were no signs of foul play in the park or in Jason's car. Jason withdrew $20 from his bank account the day before he disappeared, and his bank account has not been touched since. In 2017, Jason's parents made the difficult decision to have Jason declared legally dead. His father John's health was declining, and his mother had medical issues as well. They hoped that the process would give them a chance to say goodbye to Jason before they passed away. The process was completed in January of 2018. A memorial marker was installed for Jason at Susquehanna Memorial Garden in his hometown. Jason's father John passed away in 2019. Even 25 years after his disappearance, investigative efforts to find Jason are ongoing. In 2022, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released a new image of what Jason may look like today. Jason's mother, Deborah, had a bench installed in Jason's name at the Botanical Gardens at Clemson. She travels there yearly to remember her son and write him a letter as part of her efforts to cope with his disappearance. She still hopes she will find answers about what became of her son within her lifetime. On November 20th, 2006, at approximately 3 p.m., two women were walking on a path through the marshy area behind the Golden Key Motel, one of a string of seedy flop houses along Black Horse Pike in the West Atlantic City area of Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey. Looking down at a drainage ditch that ran behind the motel, they saw a woman's body partially under the water in the ditch. They called the police. When police arrived at the scene, they found the body the women had seen 
but as they searched the area, they also discovered the bodies of three other women in the drainage ditch. The bodies were all found along the ditch, spaced out no more than 50 yards apart from one another. None of the bodies had purses, wallets, or identification with them. They were all fully clothed, except they were all missing their socks and shoes. They had all been found with their heads pointing east, towards Atlantic City. Authorities would soon come to believe that all four women had been killed by the same perpetrator. The orientation of the bodies and their proximity to the eastbound lane of the Atlantic City Expressway would lead to their unknown killer being frequently referred to as the Eastbound Strangler, among other monikers. Based on the levels of decomposition present in the four bodies, police believed all four victims had been killed at different times. The first victim had been killed as early as six weeks prior to the discovery of her body. The second victim was killed approximately two weeks later. The third died approximately a week after the second victim, and the fourth was killed approximately a week after that, shortly before the bodies were found on November 20th. The body that had brought the police to the scene, and the most recent to have been killed, belonged to 35-year-old Kim Raffo. Kim had grown up in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Canarsie. Both her young parents had struggled with substance abuse, but despite the issues at home, Kim was a loving and happy child who was always smiling. As Kim entered adulthood, she seemed to be on the right path towards a more stable life. She married her husband Hugh in 1989, and the couple moved to Florida to be with Kim's sister and mother, who had divorced Kim's father in 1988. Hugh found a good job working in construction, and the couple purchased a four-bedroom home in Pembroke Pines. Kim and Hugh welcomed a daughter in 1992 and a son in 1994. In addition to her own children, Kim also helped take care of her sister's two children. She was active volunteering with the PTA and Girl Scouts, and her next-door neighbor reported that Kim and her family were ideal neighbors. Kim's idyllic life eventually fell apart, For some reason, something abruptly changed in Kim in 2001, according to her loved ones. I don't know if she just tired of being the one everyone always relied on, her sister Marie said shortly after Kim's death. I don't know if she just got fed up with being supermom or the superwoman of the family. We don't know. I wish I could have had my final words with her. That year, Kim enrolled in a cooking class at the Sheridan Technical Center in Hollywood, Florida. Through the class, she met a habitual drug user named Kenny and began having an affair with him. When Kim's husband, Hugh, learned of the affair, he attacked Kenny with a baseball bat. Kim refused to end the affair with Kenny or give up the cocaine habit she was beginning to develop under his influence. Hugh therefore took the kids and left. He sold the family home and took the children to Ocean City, New Jersey. Kim moved to Atlantic City to be closer to her children bringing Kenny with her. After Hugh and Kenny got into another altercation, Kim and Hugh's children were placed in foster care. When they first arrived in Atlantic City, Kim and Kenny both found steady employment at a restaurant inside the Taj Mahal Casino. However, they quickly fell into the drug scene prevalent throughout Atlantic City. Kim's once social drug habit turned into a full-blown addiction to crack cocaine fueled by her guilt over no longer being with her children. Neither she nor Kenny could hold a job anymore as their drug habit escalated. Kenny began shoplifting, and Kim turned to sex work, selling herself on Pacific Avenue, known locally as The Track, one block inland from the boardwalk. On September 9, 2006, Kim's estranged husband, Hugh, arrived in Atlantic City. He had been working construction jobs up and down the East Coast. Kenny was in jail at the time on a shoplifting charge. Hugh told his estranged wife he was there to help her if she wanted to get her life back on track. When Hugh left Atlantic City, Kim went with him and stayed with him for several weeks at a motel in Jericho, New York, on Long Island, while Hugh was working in the area. The couple did not reconcile, but Hugh still viewed his estranged wife as a friend he wanted to help. After five weeks in New York, Kim told Hugh that she had unfinished business she needed to handle back in Atlantic City. She made plans to meet back up with Hugh after a week before leaving for New Jersey, but she never returned. This had not been the first time Hugh had tried to help Kim get her life back on track. 
but it unfortunately would be the last. The last confirmed sightings of Kim alive occurred in the early hours of November 19th, the day before her body was found. She came in to Papa Joe's, a diner on Pacific Avenue, shortly after it opened at 2.30 a.m. According to Joseph Bocino, the owner of the diner who also knew Kim, she ordered her usual breakfast of two fried eggs, American cheese and sausage on a Kaiser roll, and a Mountain Dew. After she ate, Kim went outside and got into a black Nissan Maxima. A source who had been a high-ranking member of law enforcement, working on the case early on, would later tell NJ Advanced Media, speaking under the condition of anonymity, that Kim had been with a client in a room at the Taj Mahal Hotel and Casino. She left the room to go buy drugs around 5 a.m., telling her client that she would come back to the room. She never did. He called her several times, but she never answered. The client, a doctor from North Jersey, was identified using Kim's cell phone records. He was cleared by police because surveillance footage supported his account and showed him at the hotel and in the casino. Post-mortem examination would determine that Kim had died as a result of strangulation with some sort of rope or cord. Because of decomposition, authorities were only able to state more broadly that the second to last woman killed had died of asphyxiation, with strangulation being a possibility. She was 23-year-old Tracy Ann Roberts from Bear, Delaware. Tracy had been an active and loving child whose favorite thing to do was spend time with her friends. Her life began to go off track when she was 14 and she began experimenting with drugs and alcohol. She dropped out of high school at 16 and found a job as a telemarketer for a mortgage broker. She began dating one of her co-workers and gave birth to their daughter when she was 18. The baby's father was awarded primary custody of her when she was five months old. Tracy began taking steps to improve her life, enrolling in a trade school and training to be a medical assistant. She found a job at a doctor's office and the Delaware Housing Authority helped her purchase a townhome. Tracy's boyfriend brought their daughter to live with her there. According to Tracy's mother, this was the happiest time of Tracy's life. This happy period soon ended, however, when the doctor's office where Tracy worked moved after she had been there for almost a year, leaving her without a job or any way of making her mortgage payments. Her relationship with her daughter's father ended and her home went into foreclosure. Tracy began using cocaine with increasing frequency. Tracy spent a few years moving between Delaware, Philadelphia, and South Jersey. She returned to Atlantic City for the last time in August of 2006, trying to escape an abusive relationship. She worked for a time as an exotic dancer, until her drug use left her too thin and frail for club owners to want to employ her. She then turned to the streets and to sex work. The once social Tracy became isolated and quiet according to other sex workers she met during this time. Shortly before her death, Tracy had almost left Atlantic City. On November 8th, a man who had wanted to be her pimp had punched Tracy so forcefully in the neck that she began coughing up blood and had to be taken to a hospital. While she was there, she called her mother, Joyce, to ask her to come pick her up and bring her back to Delaware. Joyce made the 90-minute drive, but found when she reached the hospital that she had arrived five minutes too late. Tracy had just checked herself out and left with two unidentified men. We are good people who had a daughter who had a disease, Joyce Roberts said during an interview less than a month later, after Tracy's body was found. She had a drug addiction. It was cocaine. She wasn't just a prostitute in Atlantic City. This was somebody's daughter. The cause of death of the other two victims could not be determined because of the advanced level of decay in their bodies by the time they were discovered. 42-year-old Barbara Brider, believed to be the second woman killed, had grown up in a loving and stable home in the suburbs of Philadelphia and spent summers with her family at the beaches of the Jersey Shore, not far from where her body was ultimately found. She was charming and witty and considered to be the smartest of her siblings, who encouraged her to go on the game show Jeopardy because she was always able to quickly shout out the right answers when she watched it because she was knowledgeable about such a broad range of topics. Barbara's life changed dramatically when her father died suddenly. His loss tore her family apart and left Barbara in a deep depression. 
she studied at a community college before transferring to Penn State, but left school after struggling to get through her first year there. She moved to the Jersey Shore for a fresh start and seemed to do well in her new life, holding down a series of steady waitressing jobs. When Barbara's mother opened up the Santa Fe Trading Company, a small chain of stores selling Native American art, jewelry, and clothing, Barbara went to work for her, first working at her shop on the Atlantic City boardwalk and eventually managing the business. However, when Barbara's mother decided to retire and sold the business, Barbara had to go back to waitressing. In 1997, Barbara achieved her lifelong goal of becoming a mother, giving birth to her daughter, Dominique. However, when Dominique was four, Barbara sent Dominique to live with her sister Valerie in Florida. Dominique's father had become addicted to painkillers after he was prescribed them after undergoing back surgery many years earlier. Years before Dominique was born, Barbara had taken one of his pills to help with severe menstrual cramps. A small decision, which would ultimately have dire and major implications. As the years went on, her own dependency grew, and when the couple was cut off by doctors and could no longer get the prescription medication, they eventually turned to heroin. While it was her escalating drug use that had led to Barbara needing to send her daughter to her sister, her heartbreak at being away from Dominique only encouraged her growing problem. Eventually, Valerie severely limited contact between Dominique and Barbara so as not to upset Dominique, because Barbara would sob uncontrollably at the end of their phone calls and cling to her at the end of their visits. Barbara ultimately agreed to give up custody of her daughter completely because it was what was best for Dominique, and Valerie's adoption of Dominique was finalized within weeks of Barbara's death. Dominique remained in Florida with her aunt, uncle, and two cousins. She was put into therapy and became an excellent student with plans to go to college. Barbara's drug use was also a means of self-medicating as she dealt with alleged domestic violence at the hands of Dominique's father. The relationship ended when he was sent to prison on drug possession and burglary charges. Around this time, Barbara started smoking crack and supporting herself through sex work. Barbara was last seen leaving a house she was staying at with a friend in Ventnor, New Jersey on October 17th. Her two sisters tried to file a missing persons report on her, but say police gave them the runaround after they discovered Barbara had a previous arrest for solicitation. My sister didn't deserve to die the way she died and then to be thrown like a piece of trash in a muddy ditch. I hope they get the SOB that did this, Barbara's sister Francine said after Barbara's body was found. The fourth body, believed to belong to the first woman killed, was so heavily decomposed that authorities had to rely on releasing descriptions of some of the tattoos still visible on it in order to identify the victim. She may have been killed as early as six weeks prior to the discovery of her body. Molly Diltz was just 20 years old at the time of her death. She was from the small mining town of Black Lake, Pennsylvania, where she grew up with not a lot of money, but a lot of love from her family. Molly had been a warm and caring child, who struggled as she faced hardships as a young adult. She had trouble coping with the deaths of her mother and her brother when she was a teenager. In response to the losses, she developed a rebellious streak, which led to drinking, drug use, and a few minor run-ins with the law. She was enrolled in the special education program at Blairsville High School, but frequently missed school, and dropped out during her junior year. The courts sent her to rehab, but she did not remain sober after leaving. In June of 2005, Molly gave birth to her son, Jeremiah. She willingly signed over custody of him to her father. Molly spent the year following Jeremiah's birth, traveling between her hometown in Western Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. She first arrived in Atlantic City in the summer of 2006. She came back to visit her family in Pennsylvania at the beginning of October, and told them that things were starting to turn around. She still occasionally smoked marijuana, but had stopped using any kind of harder drug. Her family last heard from her on October 7th, when she called Collect from a phone booth in Atlantic City. Problems plagued the investigation into the four murders from the very beginning. The water in the drainage ditch contaminated the bodies and washed away potential trace evidence. Police believed that the women had been killed elsewhere, and their bodies had just been disposed of in the drainage ditch, leaving them without primary crime scenes to investigate. 
Furthermore, many of the similarities between the four victims had alternative explanations, calling into question their significance. Three out of the four victims had previous arrests for solicitation. Molly Diltz had no such arrests, and her father was not convinced that she had ever turned to sex work, but other women working in the area reported that she had in the weeks before her death. While this may point to the killer being a client who found his victims by picking them up on the streets, the lives of the four women overlapped in other ways as well. They were all known to frequent several of the same motels, restaurants, and soup kitchens, providing a wide variety of overlapping locations in their lives where they also could have crossed paths with the person who killed them. Post-mortem examinations showed that the victims had various kinds of substances in their systems at the times of their deaths. Kim and Tracy had large amounts of cocaine, Molly had a large amount of alcohol, and Barbara had a potentially lethal amount of heroin. Each woman was known to abuse the substance found in her system, so it is unclear if they had acquired the drug on their own or if the killer had provided it to them in an effort to incapacitate them. Defensive wounds could not be found on any of the women's bodies. This is most significant in the case of Kim Raffo, whose body was found relatively quickly, so the lack of discernible defense wounds could not be attributed to advanced decomposition. The heads of all four victims were found pointed in the same direction, east. This led to speculation that the killer was making a statement about Atlantic City, as it was in that direction. Because the woman had been found barefoot and facing the general direction of Mecca, rumors also circulated that a Muslim had been responsible for the murders, as Muslims say their daily prayers, barefoot and facing Mecca. A Muslim man, who was a convicted drug dealer and a friend of Kim Raffo, was brought in by police for questioning, but could never be tied to the murders. In addition, the positions of the heads could also potentially be alternatively explained by the pull of the current in the water in the ditch as it flowed out to the bay, rather than by a deliberate choice made by the killer. The circumstance that appears least likely to have an alternative explanation is the fact that all four women were found barefoot, which some investigators believe may indicate that the killer had some sort of foot fetish. Several other sex workers have reported having clients with such an interest around the time of the murders. One of them, a woman named Denise, has come forward reporting a particularly concerning incident. A client of hers had been obsessed with her shoes, to the point where she had given him a pair of them to keep. He was talking about some crazy stuff. He was talking about, like, really bizarre stuff, like he's killed some people, she later told 48 Hours who brought in a sketch artist to develop a sketch with Denise's help. The client later sent Denise a Christmas card in which he referred to himself as the River Man, feared to be a reference to the Green River Killer, who murdered sex workers in Washington State. The man was eventually identified and found to be a drifter. No direct links between him and the murders has been discovered. The Atlantic City Prosecutor's Office Major Crimes Unit, the Egg Harbor Township Police Department, the Atlantic City Police Department, the FBI, and the New Jersey State Police all worked on the investigation. They conducted interviews and questioned potential suspects, but have never identified a formal suspect in the case. A man who had been staying at the Golden Key Motel was reported to police by his ex-girlfriend after he evicted her from his house following an ongoing domestic dispute and served time in prison after evidence of an unrelated crime was discovered during a search of his home, but the investigation has never led to any arrests for the murders. A potential major development in the case came four years after the four bodies were found in December of 2010. Four bodies belonging to women who had been involved in sex work were discovered wrapped in burlap along a remote stretch of Ocean Parkway near Gilgo Beach on Long Island. The similarities between the New York murders and the Atlantic City murders led to speculation that they may have been connected. Authorities in Suffolk County, New York, were in contact with the investigators working on the 2006 murders in Atlantic City. Several other bodies of individuals believed to have been killed by the same individual who took the lives of the four victims found near Gilgo Beach were found in the following year, but no concrete link to the Atlantic City cases was ever identified. In November 2016, near the 10th anniversary of the discovery of the four bodies, acting Atlantic County Prosecutor Diane M. Ruberton declined to say if her office believed the Atlantic City cases were connected to those in Long Island. 
The week before, however, the Suffolk County Police Department stated that they believed the cases on Long Island and the cases in West Atlantic City were not related. The Golden Key Motel remained a dangerous place, rife with illegal activities in the years after the murders. Along with many of its neighboring flop houses, it was severely damaged during Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Egg Harbor Township purchased several of the damaged motels in November of 2013 and demolished them in 2015 with hopes of redeveloping the area. In a statement released in 2018, Atlanta County Prosecutor Damon G. Tyner refused to describe the still unsolved murders as a cold case because the case is still being actively investigated by multiple agencies. In the same statement, Egg Harbor Township Police Chief Raymond Davis said, as an original supervisory member of the investigative team assigned to this case, I can confirm that these victims are not forgotten. All member agencies involved in this investigation, local, county, state, and federal, remain diligent in our pursuit of the person or persons responsible. We urge anyone with information to contact law enforcement. 15 years after Kim Raffo, Molly Diltz, Barbara Brider, and Tracy Roberts were killed, their killer has still not been identified. Pamela Hollopanen grew up in the South Porcupine neighborhood of Timmins, a mining town in Northern Ontario. Her mother, Holly Kautuk, was Inuit, and her family was originally from Nunavut. Like many indigenous individuals in Canada, Holly was sent to a boarding school. She arrived at the school at the age of 14, and a year later, she became pregnant with Pamela's older sister, Vanessa Brusso. Pamela was born two years after Vanessa. Holly did her best to actively raise her daughters in their Inuit culture and teach them to embrace their heritage in their daily lives as much as possible. Since there were no other Inuit in Timmins, she was also active in the local indigenous community, the Cree. Holly would eventually become the president of the Timmins Native Friendship Center. Pamela and Vanessa were very close growing up and relied heavily on one another. They grew up in poverty and therefore had very few toys, so they used their imaginations to make up games and activities together. Pamela was outgoing and outspoken. She had a big personality, which was also reflected in how deeply she cared for others and the great lengths she would go to to help anyone who needed anything. Pamela left school prior to graduating high school so she could go to work. Following a brief stint as a waitress, she found a job in a call center where she excelled. By 2003, 22-year-old Pamela had a common-law spouse with whom she had two sons. She was a devoted mother. Pamela and Vanessa remained close as adults and it was common for them to speak multiple times a day. On December 13th, 2003, Pamela asked Vanessa if she could babysit her two boys that night. Vanessa was unable to, so Pamela made other arrangements. Vanessa went to Pamela's house on December 15th, but no one was home. She continued visiting the house over the next few days to see her sister and drop off Christmas presents for her nephews, but no one was ever at the house. Vanessa assumed that they had gone to spend Christmas with Pamela's common-law spouse's family. Pamela did not call Vanessa on Christmas Day, which Vanessa was very upset about. On December 26th, Vanessa was able to speak with Pamela's landlord. They had not seen the family either. At this point, Vanessa was still under the assumption that her sister was with her common-law spouse's family and simply failing to call her. Vanessa learned that she was wrong on New Year's Eve. That day, Vanessa and her mother were at a bingo hall when a woman came up to them and asked if they had heard about Pamela. They said they did not, and the woman told them that Pamela had left her common-law spouse. Vanessa and Holly then asked where Pamela's children were. They were still with their father. This was an immediate indication that something was not right to Vanessa and Holly. It was conceivable that Pamela would leave her spouse. There was not even a remote possibility, however, that Pamela would go anywhere without her sons. Vanessa and Holly went to police to report Pamela missing. While they made the report as soon as they realized that something was wrong, it had been more than two weeks since anyone had seen Pamela. 
She had attended a house party on the evening of December 13th and had left it in the early morning hours of the 14th after reportedly getting into an argument with her common-law spouse and saying she would walk home. Police were not concerned about Pamela's disappearance, telling Vanessa and Holly that Pamela was probably out drinking and would reappear in a few days, a conclusion with no supporting evidence. Vanessa and Holly, understandably frustrated by this disregard for Pamela's well-being, began their own search, organizing friends and family members to create and distribute flyers and to search for Pamela. Four months after Pamela went missing, when police finally began investigating Pamela's disappearance, they told her family that they believed Pamela was a sex worker in Hamilton, Ontario. They supported this claim with two nude pictures Pamela had taken of herself, presumably for her common-law spouse, that had been found on her personal computer. The case was eventually taken over by the Ontario Provincial Police, but the investigator assigned to the case faced allegations of attempted murder and arson and spent time in jail. In 2013, the case was sent back to police in Timmins, who told Pamela's sister Vanessa that the case was not active. Pamela's mother Holly passed away on December 31st, 2007, exactly four years to the day after she reported her daughter missing to police. Vanessa Brousseau continues to advocate and search for her sister. She is active on social media, sharing her sister's story, as well as stories of the challenges facing Indigenous people in Canada. Brenda Joyce Holland was born on July 8, 1947, the second of Geraldine and Charles Shotgun Holland's four children. She was born and raised in the mountains of Western North Carolina, where her family ties went back for generations. The Hollands lived in the town of Canton, where the economy relied heavily on the local paper mill, where Brenda's father worked as a floor manager. Brenda's parents felt secure in the community and hoped their children would remain in the relative safety of their mountains. Brenda's ambitions would take her away from Canton, but she was mindful of her parents' feelings and getting their approval as she went after each of her goals. While some of her choices may have seemed drastic to her parents, Brenda took their concerns into consideration when making her plans. Brenda was the first member of her family to attend college. Her family physician, Dr. Matthews, had encouraged her to enroll at Campbell College. The small Baptist institution was in North Carolina, but still nearly 300 miles away in the town of Buies Creek. Brenda's father was not opposed to his daughter receiving a college education, but her mother was worried about paying for college and about her daughter being so far away from home. With the help of Dr. Matthews, Brenda was able to work out the logistical concerns of going away to school and got her mother to agree to letting her attend. Brenda eventually wanted to move off of campus and into a boarding house run by a local widow, but knew this would be pushing her parents' limits. She ultimately secured their permission by taking care of the necessary preparations and by appealing to the amount of money the move would save each month. Brenda became very active with the drama program at the school and soon got a paid position as a costumer for the Campbell Players. She was successful in this position due to both her creativity and her hardworking nature. She considered staying on campus during a semester break to do more for the department because she was concerned that completing her assigned tasks alone did not merit the paycheck she received. Brenda dreamed of having a career in theater and considered moving to New York City to work odd jobs while making connections with the Broadway community. However, she knew that her parents would never approve of such a plan and therefore made slightly more local arrangements for her employment over the summer of 1967, following her sophomore year of college. Brenda had been hired to be the makeup supervisor for The Lost Colony, an outdoor symphonic drama that had been staged in the town of Manio in North Carolina's Outer Banks since 1937. While a local production may not seem comparable to a Broadway play, 
Working on The Lost Colony was a major opportunity for Brenda. The play, which details the history and mystery of the Roanoke Colony and the unexplained disappearance of more than 100 of its settlers, continues to be a major and respected production to this day. During the 1966 season, the year before, Brenda was hired to work on the play. More than 145,000 tickets had been sold for the outdoor performance throughout its summer run. As of 2022, more than 4 million people have seen the production, and it received an honorary Tony Award in 2013. Working on The Lost Colony would allow Brenda to work with multiple individuals in the theater community with experience within and outside of North Carolina. Her position as the makeup supervisor gave her the chance to work under famed costumer Irene Smart Rains, famous for her work as the costume director for the Carolina Playmakers at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Joe Layton, who directed and choreographed The Lost Colony for the 1967 season, had extensive credits working on Broadway and in television. One of the most popular television stars of the time also had ties to The Lost Colony and to Manio. Andy Griffith, who in 1967 was near the end of the eight season run of his successful eponymous television show, owned a home in Manio and spent time there when he wasn't filming. His love of the town stemmed from his time there working on The Lost Colony. One of his earliest stage roles had been as a soldier in the play and he would return for several more seasons, eventually playing the role of Sir Walter Raleigh. As good of an opportunity working on The Lost Colony would be for Brenda, her parents did not want her moving even farther away from their home for the summer. They instead wanted her to come home to Canton and go back to her job at a local drive-in, arguing that she would make more than the $45 a week she would earn working on the play by doing so. They eventually relented and signed off on her employment contract for the summer, as was required at the time. Brenda's parents were frustrated to learn that their daughter ultimately would be unable to come home to see them at the end of her spring semester before heading to the coast to start work on the play. The last time they had seen her was at the end of March for Easter. This meant they had not seen Brenda since she had decided to dramatically change her hair on May 12th dyeing it blonde, and cutting it into a stylish bob. On May 31st, 1967, Brenda caught a ride from Buies Creek to Manio from a fellow Campbell student who had occasionally taken Brenda out on dates and was a native of Manio. For the summer, Brenda would share an efficiency apartment on the upper level of a local family's home with another student working on the Lost Colony for the season. Brenda's dedication to her job quickly earned her the respect of those she worked with, and she built up a social life in Manio based largely around the play. She quickly began integrating into the Lost Colony community and the coastal community of Manio. While Brenda may not have been living a conservative lifestyle by her parents' standards, she was social and curious rather than wild and rebellious. She mainly attended parties not to drink or cause trouble but for the opportunity to speak to a variety of people, sometimes ending the night still holding the same beer she had started the night with. She went out on casual dates with a few men in the weeks following her arrival in Manio, with her supervisor from the play keeping a watchful eye on her and giving her advice on how to avoid being taken advantage of. Unable to spend time with her younger brother and sister, as she was accustomed to, Brenda got to know the younger members of the cast and crew, including a 13-year-old boy who sold seat cushions at the theater. He had suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and had never learned to swim, so Brenda taught him how to at Nags Head Beach and reassured him when he struggled. Brenda kept in touch with her parents by regularly sending them letters. At the performance of The Lost Colony on July 1, 1967, Everything seemed perfectly normal to the audience, but backstage, the cast and crew was growing concerned. Brenda Holland had not shown up for work. While an unexplained absence may not have been cause for alarm when it came to some members of the crew, when it was Brenda involved, it was. While she had only been working on the play for a month, she had never missed a shift. Furthermore, Cora Twyford, 
who performed as a colonist in the play and was Brenda's landlady, reported that Brenda had not come home the night before. While it was common for some of her boarders to stay out all night, like Brenda's roommate, who had not arrived home until 7 a.m. that morning, it was unheard of for Brenda to do so. Brenda had left after the previous night's performance with Danny Barber, a chorus singer in the play, to go out on a date. At intermission, Cora Twyford and the play's general manager asked Danny when he had last seen Brenda. At first, he stated that he had dropped her off in front of the house where she was staying. When Cora told him she knew that this wasn't true because Brenda had never come home, he admitted that he and Brenda had gone back to his house after their date. They had been talking and reading magazines in his room, and he fell asleep. When he woke up that morning, Brenda was gone, and he assumed that at some point after he fell asleep, she had walked the few blocks back to where she was staying on her own. The general manager called the sheriff's office to report Brenda missing at 9.20 p.m. and drove over programs for the play, which contained a photo of Brenda, to the office after the conclusion of the night's performance. After a sleepless night, he called the sheriff's office again at 6 o'clock the following morning to reiterate his concerns and try to get the investigation pushed forward, even though it was a Sunday. The sheriff's investigation began that morning, and alerts about Brenda's disappearance went out throughout the state. However, notifying Brenda's family that she was missing proved difficult, as no one was answering the phone at the family home. Brenda's older sister Anne learned that her sister was missing through a radio broadcast she heard over the AM radio in her car on her way home from church Sunday evening. Anne knew why her family had not answered their phone and why no one in Canton was able to find them. The family had gone to stay at a remote trailer they owned near Lake Glenville, an hour west of Canton. The trailer had no phone, so once Anne notified the Hayward County Sheriff's Office of their location, a deputy was sent out to notify Brenda's parents of her disappearance. The Holland family had gone to bed early that night, so they were all asleep when the deputy arrived. After learning their daughter was missing, Brenda's parents quickly packed up and left for Canton so that they could drop off their two youngest children with their oldest daughter and her family before continuing on to Manio to help look for Brenda. On Monday morning, approximately 75 volunteers joined sheriff's deputies in a search for Brenda. Most of the volunteers were cast or crew members from the Lost Colony. The scale of the search increased over the following few days. Helicopters from the Coast Guard searched from the air, and soldiers from the Marines joined the effort. The search parties grew as Brenda's family members and fellow students at Campbell College arrived to help. On July 6th, at 10.15 in the morning, a pilot with the Civil Air Patrol spotted something in the Albemarle Sound off the coast of a small fishing village northwest of Manio. When he circled back at a lower altitude to look again, he realized that the object in the water below was in fact a human body. He radioed in what he had found and circled the area so as to not lose sight of it until law enforcement arrived. The body was pulled from the water and confirmed to be Brenda Holland. Brenda's body was driven to Norfolk, Virginia, so that her autopsy could be performed at the office of the Virginia State Medical Examiner. North Carolina did not have a statewide medical examiner's office at the time, and the facility in Virginia was the closest one with the best equipment and experienced pathologists. Brenda had wounds around her neck, and the pathologist found that she had died as the result of ligature strangulation. He also found signs that Brenda had been raped. Whether or not rape was the motive for Brenda's murder is not entirely certain. Investigators were initially confused as to why her killer would redress her so exactly after raping her. When her body was found, she was still wearing her underwear, a bodysuit, and a tight skirt, still completely buttoned up. Furthermore, witness accounts of statements made by Brenda indicate that the injuries that pointed to her being raped may have been inflicted in a separate incident. Days before her death, Brenda had confided in her supervisor, Irene Rains, 
that she had a bad experience while on a date with a local man she had been seeing. Brenda stated, I'm no good, and said that she would no longer be seeing the man. She further confided in Danny Barber, her date on her last evening alive, about the incident. During an interview with authorities, he stated that Brenda had told him about this man and his mistreatment of her. He said she told him about him going to bed with her, about the rough treatment. It was very repulsive and it had changed her outlook on life. If Brenda had been raped by this man while on a date earlier on in the week, these specific injuries found on her body may not have been connected to her murder, but rather to the earlier assault, leaving the question of whether or not she had been raped just prior to her murder open. Brenda's body was taken back to Canton for her funeral and burial. Her parents received mourners at a local funeral home on the evening of July 8th, the day that should have been Brenda's 20th birthday. Her funeral was held the following afternoon at her family church, and she was buried in a lot in the cemetery her parents had purchased just a few years earlier, with the belief that their children would be burying them there first. Some of the friends Brenda had made during her time in Manio, while working on the Lost Colony, traveled to Canton for her funeral. 100 other members of the cast and crew attended a memorial service held for her back in Manio, which was held at the same time as the service in Canton. Dare County Sheriff Frank Cahoon quickly zeroed in on Brenda's last date, Danny Barber, as his main suspect, and Danny was one of the first people he contacted when Brenda went missing. 24-year-old Danny had served three years in the Army, where he had been a member of the U.S. Army Band and was a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 1967 was his third season as a singer in The Lost Colony. According to Danny, after the performance on June 30th, he and Brenda had gone to a bar where they each had one beer, and then to Jeanette's Pier, to watch people who were shark fishing. They returned to the home he was sharing with two housemates, just after 2 a.m., and went up to Danny's bedroom because they did not want to make noise in the living room and disturb one of Danny's housemates, who they knew was home. Danny and Brenda then talked for a while, and kissed, but did not have sex. They then passed a magazine back and forth, reading articles to each other. At some point, Danny fell asleep and woke up hours later to find Brenda gone. He assumed she had just walked home, rather than wake him up to get a ride. When first asked about when he last saw Brenda by the play's general manager on July 1st, Danny at first lied and said he had dropped her off at the home where she was staying, around 2 a.m., when he had in fact taken her to his place at that time and had never taken her home. This initial falsehood made him look suspicious, although it may have been the product of Danny's more conservative nature rather than him having something to hide. Danny would later tell the play's general manager that he was afraid of Brenda's boss, Irene Rains. Irene was very concerned about the young people who worked under her, and if she had thought that the interactions between crew members was inappropriate, she would not hesitate to confront them about it. Danny, unaware of the seriousness of the situation at the time of the questioning, may not have wanted Irene to find out that he had been alone in his bedroom with Brenda. Furthermore, Danny's failure to take Brenda home seems to have violated his own understanding of gentlemanly conduct. According to Cora Twyford's daughter Penny, Danny came to their house to apologize to her mother for failing to see Brenda safely back to the room Cora was renting out to her. He appeared to have recognized that he made a mistake and was upset over it. Regardless of the reason for this initial lie, Danny was still the last known person to have seen Brenda, and he admitted to being alone with her in his bedroom. It was not inconceivable to the sheriff that he may have wanted more from Brenda sexually and killed her when she did not consent. However, Danny's version of events did appear to be supported by a statement from his housemate who had been in his room that night. He heard Danny and a girl go up to Danny's room and was woken up later that night by the sound of the front door opening and someone quietly exiting the house. He did not, however, hear any signs of a struggle inside the house or the sound of a car starting up after the door to the house was opened. 
If Danny had killed Brenda in his room, he would have needed to get her downstairs and transport her by car to the water to dispose of her body, which would have created a lot of noise. What the housemate heard sounds more in line with Brenda waking up and deciding to walk home, rather than waking up Danny to drive her. While Brenda's parents were in town when her body was found, and could have identified it in a more clinical setting. Sheriff Cahoon apparently hoped to rattle his prime suspect with the sight of Brenda's badly decomposed body. Danny Barber was therefore brought in to identify Brenda's body as it lay in a hearse near where it was found. Danny had to step away for a moment after seeing her, but then confirmed that it was Brenda. He based his identification off of a necklace Brenda always wore which she had been given for winning Miss Congeniality in the Miss Hayward County beauty pageant the year before. Danny came in for multiple, often hours long interviews, including one that kept him from attending Brenda's memorial service in the days after her body was found. Danny would later state that nothing he told the officers seemed to convince them that he hadn't killed Brenda. His brother eventually convinced him to hire a lawyer who placed limits on law enforcement's access to Danny. Authorities remained focused on Danny in their investigation and continued to put pressure on him. An agent from the State Bureau of Investigation was in the audience of every performance of The Lost Colony Danny sang in for the rest of the summer. Agents from the SBI interviewed Danny twice in Chapel Hill after he returned to school, once in November of 1967 and once in April of 1968. The SBI tracked his changes in residence and his employment as he entered the corporate world after graduation in the following years. Those who knew Danny and Brenda generally did not believe Danny could have had anything to do with Brenda's murder. Whispers of his involvement nevertheless persisted throughout town, with a popular rumor maintaining that Danny left Manio at the end of the summer of 1967 and never returned which some believed pointed towards his guilt. This was not true, however. Dan, as he was known once he began his successful career in business, vacationed in Dare County with his family regularly, with their last trip occurring just months before he passed away. He took his wife Diane, and later their two children, to see the lost colony. He told Diane about Brenda's murder, and how police had tried to pin the crime on him. She does not believe that her husband could have returned to Manio, much less brought his family there, had he been involved. The two main emotions he seems to have felt about the events of the summer of 1967 were genuine confusion over how anyone could have wanted to harm Brenda, and gratitude for his brother insisting he retain a lawyer when he did not know what to do in the face of intense interrogation. Dan was contacted by the SBI again in 1985 and 1995, and according to the SBI files, he was open and cooperative. He retired as vice president of national sales for Sara Lee Hosiery in 1994, and turned his attention back to his love of singing and performing. Dan Barber passed away unexpectedly in January of 2011, just days after his 68th birthday. While Dan Barber was the most popular suspect with law enforcement, years after Brenda's murder, new information would point to a new suspect who had no connection to Brenda at all, and no chance of being convicted of the crime, as he was by then long since deceased. For many years, Dr. Linus Edwards was the only dentist in Manio. On Valentine's Day of 1971, Dr. Edwards went to the home of Dr. Harvey, Manio's general practitioner, to drop off the set of dentures he had ordered. Dr. Harvey and his wife were at a Valentine's Day party, but had left their front door unlocked, so Dr. Edwards went inside and left the dentures on the dining room table. Early that evening, Dr. Edwards made three phone calls, one to his lawyer, one to Sheriff Cahoon, and one to Dr. Harvey, asking them to come to his house. He then shot himself in the head with his 22 caliber pistol. His lawyer discovered him lying on his kitchen floor when he arrived at the house an hour after being called there. Dr. Edwards was taken to the Naval Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia, where he remained unconscious until 5 a.m. on February 16th, when he finally died. He did not leave a suicide note. Edwards was a native of Durham, North Carolina, and a member of Mensa, 
something he was very proud of. He served as a dentist with the United States Army, eventually reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Edwards was also a violent drunk. While Edwards was still in the Army, he once choked his wife so savagely and intently that her young daughter had to threaten him with a mallet to get him to stop. He was granted an honorable discharge after undergoing psychiatric treatment, just three years before he would have been eligible for his full military pension. Edward's first wife, Ida, had divorced him after 20 years of marriage in 1956, and then remarried him in 1960, with this marriage lasting just a few years. It was during the second attempt at their marriage that Edwards came to Manio, which did not have a dental office at the time, and opened a successful practice. Following his second divorce from Ida, Edwards married Dottie Fry, a young widow with two children and a long-standing family history in Manio. He and Dottie were married from 1964 until 1969, during which time Dottie was subjected to violence and abuse. Edwards physically beat his wife, at least once so badly that she needed to be hospitalized, and she and her children had to flee the home they shared with Edwards on multiple occasions. Edwards would regularly get blackout drunk, which would lead to physical and or verbal abuse. While Edwards himself had an ongoing affair during the marriage, he was very jealous and controlling of Dottie's interactions with others. He did not like her having any friends, whether they were male or female. Edwards was briefly considered a suspect in Brenda's murder after investigators received tips that he and his wife, who bore a strong physical resemblance to Brenda Holland, had domestic difficulties on the night of June 30th, and that he had drunkenly gone out that night looking for her after she fled their home. Edwards agreed to undergo a polygraph examination and passed. However, while these exams are notoriously unreliable under the best of circumstances, Edwards may also have had advantages that helped him appear truthful during the test. Just after the time Brenda was killed, he began wearing an upper body cast for some sort of unexplained neck or back injury, and he secured a prescription for Demerol. As John Rayleigh would later write, blackout drunks free of feelings of guilt and zonked out on Demerol, as Edwards might have been, can sail through the tests. Early on in the investigation, Edwards told law enforcement that his wife probably wouldn't talk to them, so they did not attempt to contact her. She might not have been forthcoming at that time because she was afraid of her husband, but investigators simply taking Edwards at his word shows an unusual amount of deference. Edwards' car and home were never searched. Edwards was formally ruled out as a suspect in September of 1967. While Dottie may have been too afraid to speak with investigators while she was still married to Edwards, even if they had asked her, she was willing to speak with them after his death. However, they were not as interested in hearing from her. Former Manio Police Chief Ken Whittingham never formally had jurisdiction over Brenda's case because her body had been found outside of city limits, but that did not diminish his interest in the case while he was with the department or after his departure from it in 1974. In 1979, while looking into the case on his own, Ken spoke to Dottie Fry. His notes indicate that on January 21st of that year, she had told him that she had unsuccessfully tried to speak to both Sheriff Cahoon and an SBI agent named Lenny Wise multiple times about her ex-husband's potential involvement in Brenda's murder, but neither man was interested in speaking with her. It seemed to Dottie that they were both still convinced of Danny Barber's guilt. Six years later, journalist Ray Pye was working on investigative pieces on Brenda's murder for the Outer Banks Current, and Ken was one of the people who spoke to him about the case. After learning about Ken's conversation with Dottie Fry, Ray contacted the SBI by phone in December of 1985 and told them of the importance of speaking with both Dottie and Ken. On April 7, 1986, almost 19 years after Brenda's murder, investigators finally interviewed Dottie Fry, and her statement provided important evidence pointing to her former husband being Brenda's killer. This interview was brief, and Dottie told her general theory of what she believed happened the night Brenda was killed, but she more fully elaborated on the events of that night in an article written by Ray Pye and published on August 7, 1986. 
Dottie's children spent a large part of their summers with their father's family in Carthage, North Carolina, some 200 miles away from Manio. So Dottie was alone with Edwards on the evening of June 30th, 1967, when he, not surprisingly, became belligerently drunk. He started yelling at Dottie, and she yelled back. He told her he was going to kill her. Dottie decided not to stay to see if he meant it. She fled the house before the altercation became physical. She got into her van and went to pick up her best friend. They drove around for the rest of the night, making a few stops throughout the Manio area. At least the beginning of Dottie's account was corroborated by two of her neighbors. Because her windows had been open that night, their neighbors heard the fight, Edwards threatening Dottie, and Dottie's van driving away. They also later heard Edward's car driving away. At least one of Dottie's friends also reported Edward's showing up at her house and angrily looking through each room in the home for Dottie that night. Dottie waited a few days for her husband to sober up before returning home. When Edward's came home and saw her there, he went pale and said, I thought you were dead. According to Dottie, Edward's would later claim to have killed Brenda Holland on multiple occasions while he was intoxicated. Dottie believed her former husband killed Brenda in a case of mistaken identity. While Dottie was older than Brenda, both women were tall and thin, with long necks and bobbed blonde hair. If Edwards had come across Brenda from behind as she was walking home from Danny Barber's home, in his intoxicated state and with his headlights as his only source of light, he may have thought that Brenda was Dottie and attacked her as he had a long history of doing to his wife. With so little light and in such an inebriated state, he may not have noticed that he had killed a different woman even after he strangled her, potentially with the braided rope straps of her handbag. Still drunk and still without light, he conceivably still could have believed the woman he killed was Dottie, even after putting her body in his car and taking it to a nearby bridge to throw it into the water. Edwards also would have had reason to believe his wife would have been in the neighborhood where he theoretically came across Brenda. Dottie was friends with both of Danny Barber's housemates and worked with one of them. Edwards did not like that his wife was friends with the young men and may have been in that area that night, checking to see if she were at their house. Dottie had, in fact, stopped at the house earlier in the evening during her drive around town with her best friend. No one was at the house when she arrived so she took a beer from the fridge and left a note before leaving. Edward's behavior seems to indicate that for a time, he did believe that he had killed his wife. He had his mistress come over to the home he shared with Dottie, which was not something he typically did. Neighbors saw her car at his house on Saturday and Sunday. Edwards went to the sheriff's office around 1 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, July 2nd to report his wife missing but claimed that she had left home after an argument just a few hours earlier, when she had actually left more than 24 hours earlier. After making his report, he went home and went to bed after about 20 minutes, potentially indicating that he was not actually concerned about anything authorities might find looking for Dottie, and that he had just made the report with the incorrect timeline to make it appear as though he was appropriately concerned for his wife. He was never questioned about the inconsistencies between his timeline and the statements of his neighbors, despite the fact that they were obvious and known to investigators well before Edwards was cleared as a suspect. Former Sheriff Cahoon, who had retired a few years before Dottie Fry's claims were made public, did not support the theory that Brenda's murder had been the result of mistaken identity, arguing that Brenda had been smothered with a pillow or blanket indicating that he was still a proponent of the theory that she had been killed in someone, presumably Danny Barber's, house. However, the pathologist had found that Brenda had been strangled, not suffocated, and no evidence contradicted that finding. Brenda's family was not notified when Dottie made her statement to the SBI. They only learned of this alternative suspect in the case when a relative happened to read the newspaper article Ray Pye wrote after speaking with Dottie. The family had still received periodic phone calls from Sheriff Cahoon as the years passed, but he always told them that Danny Barber was the most likely suspect, and they simply lacked enough evidence to file charges against him. Brenda's murder devastated her family, 
affecting her siblings and her parents in different but profound and painful ways. Her father, Charles, believing Sheriff Cahoon's assertion of Danny's probable guilt, grew angry with the sheriff for failing to make the case against the young man. He would also express his regret over not exacting revenge against the man he believed killed his daughter. Neither of Brenda's parents would live to see their daughter's case resolved. Charles Holland passed away in 2003, and his wife Geraldine followed a decade later. They are both buried near Brenda in their family plot. In 2018, in response to a series of articles written by John Raley for the Coastland Times about Brenda's murder, the SBI assigned a specialized cold case investigator to the case. Unfortunately, Brenda's case may not benefit from the passage of time and the advancement of science the same way other older cases have in recent years. Problems with the evidence in Brenda's case began almost as soon as the investigation did. The necklace she always wore was removed, rinsed, and photographed after she was pulled from the water. The necklace was then given to her father just a few hours later. While this was, of course, an act of kindness towards Charles Holland, the necklace would have been of great evidentiary importance, especially given the fact that it was determined that Brenda had been strangled. The clothes Brenda was found wearing were washed shortly after her body was found, potentially eliminating trace evidence, along with the strong smell that most likely led to them being cleaned. This is not currently relevant, however, as the clothes could not be tested now, regardless of them having been washed. All of the physical evidence from Brenda's case has been lost. Previously, physical evidence from cases the SBI was involved in remained stored at the SBI laboratory. Following a policy change, evidence in these cases was returned to the local law enforcement agencies with whom the cases originated. It is not clear if the evidence from Brenda's case went missing while it was in the custody of the SBI or the Dare County Sheriff's Office. It is not unheard of for evidence from older cases to be intentionally destroyed, but there is no record of this occurring, and it would be unusual for evidence from a case that had received so much statewide attention to have been destroyed. Ongoing efforts to solve the case are also hampered by the fact that there are no photos from the crime scene or of Brenda's body to examine. According to notes from the SBI file, a state trooper took photographs at the scene near where Brenda's body was found, but the exposures were all blank when they were developed. Renowned local photographer Acock Brown also took photographs at the scene, and two witnesses have reported seeing the photos in the past, but the current whereabouts of the photos are unknown. They are not with the case files or with Mr. Brown's private collection of his photographs, which was donated to the Outer Banks History Center. No photos from Brenda's autopsy in Virginia can be located either. While the evidence against Dr. Linus Edwards is only circumstantial, Brenda's younger sister, Kim Holland Thorne, believes he is most likely the killer and that his connections to local law enforcement influenced the investigation into Brenda's murder. After speaking with Dottie and others in Manio, I concluded that Sheriff Cahoon's friendship with Dr. Edwards kept the whole truth from being divulged. When Dr. Edwards committed suicide, there was sort of an attitude of let sleeping dogs lie, she told the Raleigh News and Observer in 1997. Investigative efforts on the case did seem to die down following Edwards' death, except for the SBI keeping track of where Danny Barber was living and working. Kim Thorne has asked that the SBI formally declare Edwards as Brenda's killer based on Dottie Fry's statements, but the agency has not agreed to do so. They did offer to close Brenda's case without identifying her murderer, but Kim will not stand for that. I said, oh hell no, it will not be closed until you say who the killer was, she said in 2018. She furthermore wants both her sister and the consequences of unprofessionalism to not be forgotten. I want it remembered. I want it at the top of the list for unsolved murders in North Carolina. They need to remember that sometimes the good old boys club doesn't work and it's wrong, she told WTKR News in 2018. Brenda's memory of course lives on in the hearts and minds of her family and friends. 
but they hope to preserve her memory in Manio as well. For several years, there have been efforts to get a plaque memorializing Brenda installed somewhere on the property where the Lost Colony continues to be performed each summer. This process has been complicated by the fact that the property is a part of the National Park Service and subject to certain rules and regulations. Hopefully these issues can be resolved so that whether or not her case is ever solved, Brenda can be remembered by all of those who come to see the play that tragically showcased her final work more than 50 years ago. In 1966, Cornell University launched a new accelerated PhD program with the assistance of a $2.1 million grant from the Ford Foundation. The program would allow incoming freshmen to complete their doctorate degree in just six years. Generally speaking, a student would need at least four years of graduate study after their four years of undergraduate education in order to obtain their PhD by following the typical path of study. Cornell was a member of the Ivy League and one of the most prestigious schools in the United States. It provided an excellent education, and many of the top students from around the world vied for admission to the school. However, the accelerated PhD program was viewed as an opportunity to set Cornell apart from other top schools in the country and lure the very best of the best students away from institutions like Harvard and Yale as it would provide them the opportunity to advance in academia at an accelerated rate. The program aimed to produce the highest quality of scholars in the shortest amount of time possible by reducing undergraduate and graduate curriculums. The program utilized a curriculum that was rigorous even by Ivy League standards and advanced placement courses in order to try to provide the same exceptional level of education in a seemingly impossibly short amount of time. It would also provide a $3,000 a year stipend during the years of graduate study so that students in the program would not need to work as research assistants or teach undergraduate courses, as many graduate students do, allowing them more time to focus on their own studies. The program would be the first of its kind in the United States. The first cohort of students in the program arrived at the school's campus in Ithaca, New York in the fall of 1966. Nearly half of the 48 students had been the valedictorian or salutatorian of their graduating high school class, and their median scores on both sections of the SAT were more than 75 points higher than the median scores of the students in Cornell's regular freshman class. There were, of course, concerns from Cornell faculty members about the program being elitist, as well as about the feasibility of students being able to handle the pressure of the accelerated program. Another controversy arose over the living situation provided for the program students. All of the students, 35 men and 13 women, would be housed together in Cornell's first co-ed dorm, the Cornell Heights Residential Club. In addition to the fact that male and female students would be living together for the first time at the school, there were concerns that the living situation would isolate the members of the program from the rest of the Cornell community. Dean Stephen Parrish, the director of the program, argued that the program having a dedicated residential center was part of what drew students to the program. The Res Club, as it would come to be known, was located on Country Club Road. It had originally been built as a motel in 1953 and was located just to the north of the Cornell campus. The university purchased it in 1964 and began using it for student housing in 1966 when the first group of students in the accelerated program arrived at Cornell. In addition to the FUDs, as the accelerated PhD students came to call themselves, the Res Club also housed approximately two dozen female students, mainly graduate students and undergraduate seniors, on its second floor. A cook, three faculty members, and a student counselor also resided there, bringing its total occupancy to 71 people. The demanding nature of the advanced PhD program often cost its members sleep, a circumstance which proved fortuitous on April 5, 1967. At 4 a.m. that morning, Diego Benardetti was still awake, having stayed up all night struggling with a paper for a government class in his room in the Res Club. 
He heard something outside his room, and when he opened his door, he found that the hallway was filling with thick smoke. He began screaming fire and running down the hallway, knocking on doors to alert his fellow students. He pulled a fire alarm as he made his exit from the building, but nothing happened when he did. Without the fire alarm, the residents of the building were mainly awoken and made aware of the fire thanks to the screams of warning from other students and the noise they made as they escaped the building. As thick, toxic smoke spread through the res club, many students could not travel through the hallways or reach an exit. Instead, they had to leave the building through its windows. The res club had two main floors and a basement level. However, because the building was constructed on slanted ground, rooms on the back side of one of the building's main wings were higher off of the ground than their locations would suggest. First floor rooms on that side of the building were a story above the ground, with the windows from the basement level at ground level. Students shoved rags and clothes against the cracks under the doors to their rooms in an attempt to hold off the smoke seeping into their room as they tried to escape through their windows. Some of the residents on higher floors jumped from their windows, and others knotted together sheets so they could climb down. Students who had escaped the building ran to a nearby fraternity house for help and located ladders to help evacuate residents of the second floor. A fraternity member arriving with the fraternity house's ladder was directed to the kitchen, where the res club's cook, who was in her mid-sixties, was leaning out of the window of her quarters above it. The fraternity member climbed the ladder, threw the cook over his shoulder, and carried her to safety. Fire trucks quickly arrived on the scene, and more students were evacuated using their ladders. Tragically, not everyone escaped the fire. Help had arrived so quickly because of a phone call made at 4.08 a.m. by John Albin Finch, Ph.D. Professor Finch was a former infantry officer in the British Army, who was, in 1967, an assistant professor of English at Cornell and the faculty resident in charge at the Res Club. After he placed the call for help, he was able to easily exit the building through its main entrance due to the location of his room on the first floor. However, after making his successful escape from the building, Professor Finch ran back inside to alert students of the danger. He banged on furniture to awaken residents and get their attention, and screamed for them to run. At least four of the fire's 62 survivors have attributed their survival directly to Professor Finch's actions. Professor Finch did not exit the building a second time. He succumbed to the smoke in the res club's foyer. His body was found near the bodies of two students, less than 15 feet away from the building's main door. Professor Finch was 37 years old. He was later remembered as a man of wide-ranging knowledge, with a lucid and flexible intelligence, a ready wit, and a quietly distinctive grace and demeanor and speech. The Finch family would continue to show dedication to the students living in the Res Club even after Professor Finch's death. His sister, Veronica Finch, traveled to Ithaca from Nigeria after being notified of her brother's death and extended her time there by two days in order to continue comforting the students who had survived the fire. In addition to Professor Finch, eight students were killed, three of them FUDs. Martha Beck was studying to be a scientist and would have become an inspiration and a role model to generations of women in science, according to one of her classmates. Jeffrey Smith had been just 17 years old at the time of his death, shy in social situations, but brilliant at math. Peter Cooch would later be described as being good at anything and everything, and someone who was instantly liked by those he met. The other five students killed were residents of the second floor, who were not a part of the accelerated PhD program. Jenny Zue Sun, 21, was a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences studying math, who had plans to work with computers after she graduated. Mei Mei Chang, 22, was a graduate nutritional sciences student who had studied German as well as four dialects of Chinese. 21-year-old Anne McCormick was a senior studying home economics. She stood only four feet 10 inches tall, but had a dynamic personality and was full of energy, which she often used to help her friends. 
Carol Kurtz, 22, was a serious and dedicated nutrition graduate student. 25-year-old graduate student Johanna Christina Walden had come to Cornell from Finland to study agriculture. One of the other Res Club residents had found a ladder during the evacuation and had initially taken it to Johanna's window so she could escape down it. However, there was a visibly distressed resident leaning out her window a few rooms down, and Johanna asked him to take the ladder to assist the more frantic resident first. Pete Seeger had been scheduled to perform on Cornell's campus on April 5th, and he took time during his performance to speak about each of the people who had died in the fire earlier that day. Two days later, a memorial service was held at Cornell's Sage Memorial Chapel. 1,200 people attended the service in person, with the overflow crowd of several hundred more people listening to the service through speakers and the student union. All nine people who perished in the fire died of asphyxiation. The fire had started in the basement lounge of the Res Club. Two couches, both made of naga hide, quickly caught fire. Naga hide is an American-made type of artificial leather with a PVC coating, which creates a thick, oily, and toxic black smoke when it is burned. Firefighters and other first responders to the scene reported feeling weak and dizzy after exposure to the residual fumes. The fire had then spread to wood paneling in the basement corridor, which carried it to the basement bedrooms and to a stairwell outside of the lounge. The Res Club was considered to be fire resistive because of its brick exterior and the precast concrete used in its construction. In one sense, this is accurate, as the building itself still stands to this day, now known as the Ecology House, and went back into use at the beginning of the fall 1967 semester after interior repairs. However, the building was full of fire code violations, which allowed the toxic smoke to spread throughout the building and prevented residents from escaping the building. The alarm system did not work, and there were no fire escapes or sprinklers in the building. Fire doors that adhere to modern standards did not exist at the time, but there had been what were considered to be adequate fire doors in the building. However, the fire doors leading to a staircase in the basement had been propped open, and two fire doors on the second floor had been taken down because they no longer fit over new carpet that had been installed. These doors, had they all been up and closed, could have helped slow the spread of the smoke. Cornell had begun the process of installing a partial sprinkler system in the building the month before the fire, but a strike at the factory of the manufacturer of the parts necessary to complete the work had caused the installation to be delayed. The parts were eventually delivered, and work on the sprinklers was scheduled to begin on April 5th, mere hours after the fire began. Robert Gaudet, an investigator with the National Fire Protection Association, who was on the scene of the fire within days of it occurring, stated that all evidence indicates that fully sprinklered buildings and detection systems have prevented loss of life and injury, but this building didn't have it. A state official and the National Fire Protection Association further found that the inadequate and substandard means of escape from the building also contributed to the deaths that resulted from the fire. In direct violation of New York state law, Cornell did not file a 1966 fire inspection report on the Res Club. Furthermore, the university did not hold any kind of fire drills in the building. In June of 1967, two months after the fire, Cornell's Board of Trustees allocated three quarters of a million dollars for what it described as an accelerated life safety program to rectify some of the safety shortcomings on campus. $40,000 went to the Res Club. The money was used to install sprinklers, two enclosed fire escapes, and an alarm system prior to the building reopening for the fall term. The university was not fined for the fire code violations brought to light by the fire. Survivors of the fire faulted the university not just for the circumstances that existed in the building prior to the fire, but also for their response to the fire, and the lack of support they showed to the surviving students and the families of those who had been lost. Some of the survivors were able to get one session with university-affiliated mental health professionals, but found them underqualified to help them cope with the trauma of the fire. 
It's clear the university behaved unbelievably badly and acted irresponsibly toward us, Fudd Joshua Freeman told the New York Times in 2018. We felt we were on our own, getting support from each other and friends and the community, and nothing whatsoever from Cornell. I can absolutely say they did nothing. Joshua's father had arrived at Cornell three days after the fire and ran into the parents of Jeffrey Smith, one of the Fudds who had died in the fire. They told him that Cornell had so far not even spoken to them about the loss of their son. The investigation into the Res Club fire did little to comfort its survivors, and in many cases only made things worse for them. Surviving residents were questioned about the fire, and many felt as though they were all being considered as suspects. The tactics used by authorities during questioning were often an additional source of stress. For example, police seemed to suspect that Diego Benardetti, who had been awake working on a paper when the fire started spreading, and therefore was one of the first residents to alert others about the danger, may have set the fire so he could then play the hero. While he was being questioned, authorities told him that they knew he had set the fire, so he may as well just confess. They also asked him to take a polygraph examination, but left him with the impression he did not really have an option in the matter. He was not the only resident who underwent such aggressive questioning, or a polygraph examination, during the initial investigation. Rumors about who started the fire quickly began circulating around campus, often to the great detriment of the individuals accused by them. Potential suspects were suggested for a variety of alleged circumstances. The cook's son was allegedly mentally unsound, a night manager who had recently been fired was reportedly witnessed at the scene, a counselor had been informed they would not be retained by the university in their position the week before the fire because he allegedly kept a can of gasoline in his kitchen. They were also concerned that the fire may have been an attack on the new accelerated PhD program, since the FUDs were housed at the Res Club and made up the majority of its residents. Perhaps someone was upset about the dorm being co-ed or bothered by the seemingly elite nature of the program. One student had already dropped out of the rigorous program, having earned all Fs in their classes, save for one D-. The possibility that he may have set the fire out of bitterness towards the program made its way through the rumor mill. Another student, who had been warned that he may be removed from the program due to his poor performance, reportedly was excited about the fire and the media attention it garnered. He was investigated by the police and underwent four polygraph examinations, all of which came back inconclusive. On May 22nd, the Cornell Daily Sun published an article based on statements from an anonymous source claiming that there had been a death club made up of FUDs. The group allegedly met to talk about death, death-related topics, and how to get as close to death as possible without actually dying. Reportedly, they played macabre music, and its members had trouble making friends with other members of the program. The article focused on one female FUD in particular, alleging that she had cut her own wrists following one of these meetings just before Christmas, and stating that she had been discussing the first chapter of the Book of Ezekiel during one of these supposed death sessions just before the Res Club fire. The first 13 verses of this book of the Bible occur on the fifth day of the fourth month and detail a fiery vision from God. The Res Club fire occurred on the fifth day of the fourth month. The problem with these rumors was that such a death club did not exist. A lot of people were talking through their hat to newspaper reporters and feeling important, Flood Lauren Cobb would later tell the New York Times. The rumor and misinformation about that program was phenomenal. The idea of quoting the Bible was not unusual. We quoted Chaucer. We quoted Beowulf. We quoted Gilgamesh. While a female student was not named in the article, she was easily identifiable because of the mention of the incident in which she cut her wrists around Christmas. A female FUD had cut her wrists the previous December, but it was after an argument with her parents, not after a so-called death session. She also had discussed the Book of Ezekiel with another student in early April, but it was while discussing a potential idea for a paper for a class. This student, unsurprisingly, did not handle the extreme scrutiny she was under as a result of the article well. She had been considered a potential suspect prior to the article being published, 
Because other students had reported her lack of satisfaction with the accelerated PhD program and claimed she had been lighting and blowing out matches with another student prior to the fire. The article only increased the pressure she was under. The director of the accelerated PhD program allegedly called her parents to tell them their daughter was a murderer. By the beginning of June, investigators realized that there was nothing to the reports of a death club and their investigation into it had done nothing to move the case forward. Damage had already been done by it, however, and the student at the center of the inquiry left Cornell, never to obtain a college degree. She initially supported herself by working at a pizza parlor, but ultimately found success working in the insurance industry. The members of the Accelerated PhD program specifically would not have long to process their trauma from the Res Club fire before events created even more stress around the incident. There was no building available to continue housing all the FUDs together, as they were used to, so they were spread throughout various locations. However, smaller groups of FUDs did remain together in their new, temporary accommodations. Three FUDs were housed at the Water Margin Collective residence, and on May 23rd, a fire broke out there. No one was injured during the fire, but it was immediately considered suspicious, as it had three separate points of origin in the residence's living room. Eight days later, another fire was set in the entranceway of a rooming house on Eddy Street in Ithaca, where seven FUDs had been living. Again, no one was harmed. However, the fatal fire in April and the two subsequent fires at the end of May had all occurred at locations where FUDs had been living and had all started between 4 and 5 a.m. In light of these connections, the Ithaca fire chief stated that there was too much coincidence for me to accept. The coincidences were also too much for many of the already traumatized FUDs to handle. The two subsequent fires seemed to confirm fears some of them had held since the fire at the Res Club, that an arsonist was targeting members of their program specifically. Many members of the program began taking extreme actions in order to ensure they would not fall victim to another fire, which seemed almost inevitable for a time. One FUD kept a long rope in his room in case he needed to escape another fire through his window and altered his schedule so that he could sleep during the day and do his schoolwork during the night, allowing him to be awake when the arsonist liked to strike. Some of the FUDs who lived together began sleeping in shifts so that someone was always awake to alert them to any danger. All I know is that he is out there and he wants to kill me. I don't know his name and he doesn't know me. Marvin L. Marshak, who is not a FUD but lived in a house with six of them, wrote in a column for the Cornell Daily Sun in June. The fears that an arsonist was targeting members of the accelerated PhD program were seemingly confirmed four months after the Res Club fire. At the coroner's inquest held two weeks after the fire, Tompkins County Coroner Dr. Ralph J. Lowe had found that while a human factor appeared to be involved in the fire rather than some sort of mechanical failure, it could not be identified without further investigation, leaving open the possibilities of the fire being either arson or an accident. The evidence presented at this inquest is such as to minimize the possibility of mechanical accident and makes the fire more probably the result of human carelessness or malice. I conclude at this time that the fire is of undetermined origin. I recommend that the investigation be continued by the district attorney's office, he said in his statement. However, in August of 1967, Ithaca Police Chief Herbert Van Ostrand announced that a Canadian chemist had found traces of a liquid accelerant at the scenes of all three of the fires that occurred at locations where FUDs were being housed, including the Res Club. The evidence of traces of accelerant being found at the Res Club specifically is not as strong as Chief Van Ostrand's statement suggests, however, and has led to ongoing controversy over the nature of that fire specifically. Chief Van Ostrand would not say what the accelerant was, as this evidence convinced him that all three fires were therefore arson, and he did not want to jeopardize any further potential prosecution in the case. However, further evidence to support an arrest was never found, and no one was ever charged with the arsons. While Cornell was not fined for the fire code violations that contributed to the loss of life during the Res Club fire, it did face financial repercussions. 
On March 14, 1968, the parents of Jeffrey Smith Jr., the youngest victim of the fire, filed a $1.75 million lawsuit against Cornell, alleging negligence. The case did not go to court until December of 1972. By this time, just Jeffrey's father was suing the school. His mother, Margaret, had died after overdosing on barbiturates in 1969. The psychiatrist who had treated both Jeffrey Sr. and Margaret, Dr. Hack, was called as a witness during the court proceedings. He had started treating both of them three weeks after the fire and diagnosed both of them with severe neurotic depression. He found the proximate cause of their depression to be the death of their son. Dr. Hack saw Margaret Smith approximately 70 times between April of 1967 and her death in October of 1969. He treated her with antidepressants in a short course of electroshock therapy, but found her to be almost completely incapacitated for the majority of the time she was under his care, despite her treatments. Jeffrey Smith Sr. had been an accountant, but his grief at his son's death and the severe depression it led to left him unable to work. His condition did not improve in the five and a half years between his son's death and his lawsuit coming to court, despite treatment. Dr. Hack testified that his energy is markedly reduced. He is without goals, beyond merely sustaining himself from day to day. His appearance is often relatively unkempt. He requires motivation to make him, and to diminish any sort of emotion, which might also produce a self-destructive suicide. The suit was settled before it was sent to a jury, and the United States Northern District Court of New York found Cornell to have been negligent. Jeffrey Smith Sr. was awarded $150,000, equivalent to nearly $1 million in 2021. Cornell's accelerated PhD program enrolled a total of four classes of FUDs and was shut down after those students completed their studies. Many of the program's students did end up completing a PhD, but not all of them did so at Cornell, and most did not do it within six years. The Res Club fire would continue to impact its survivors for years to come, with many of them requiring psychotherapy and at least one of them developing a substance abuse problem in response to the tragedy. Many students were plagued by survivor's guilt or by nightmares and flashbacks about the fire. The focus on the FUDs as the potential targets of the fires led to the surviving residents of the second floor, who were not a part of the program, to feel ignored. We were sort of considered collateral damage. We were extras, Sherry Carr, a Cornell senior who lived on the second floor, said in 2018. Ms. Carr, a retired lawyer, still has the key to her room at the rest club and still wakes up in a cold sweat at 4 a.m. every April 5th. While the effects of the fire carried throughout the lives of its survivors, no new evidence about the fire has been unearthed since 1967. In 2013, Bill Fogel, a Cornell alumnus who had been unaffiliated with the accelerated PhD program and did not live at the Res Club, began researching the fire after coming across newspaper articles about it while working with the records from his fraternity chapter to write his history. He then began an extensive effort, locating records and contacting survivors of the fire as well as members of law enforcement connected to the case. He eventually identified someone he considered to be a very strong suspect in the arsons, a FUD who left Cornell and later changed his name. In February of 2017, with the 50th anniversary of the fire approaching, Mr. Fogel wrote a letter to the editor, published in the Cornell Daily Sun. He wrote a second letter in May of 2018. In these letters, he criticizes Cornell's response to what he argues are definitively nine homicides, as well as the papers reporting on the fire. In response to Mr. Fogel, Harlan McEwen, who had been the principal Cayuga Heights police investigator assigned to the Res Club fire and had worked on the case exclusively for over a year, wrote his own letters to the editor in April of 2017 and May of 2018. Following his time as an investigator, Mr. McEwen had gone on to be Chief of Police in Cayuga Heights, the Chief of Police in Ithaca, and then an FBI Deputy Assistant Director prior to his retirement. He considered the Res Club fire to be one of the most tragic events he investigated 
during his long career. In his letters, he denied allegations made by Mr. Fogel that Cornell had interfered in his investigation, that the Cornell Daily Sun had failed in its coverage of the fire, and the claim that the nine victims of the fire had without a doubt been murdered. Recent allegations by Cornell graduate William Fogel Jr. that the Cornell Residential Club fire was an arson and the deaths should be declared murders is not supported by the facts as currently known. The facts, as I personally know them, are that nine people tragically perished from asphyxia due to toxic smoke inhalation. The ruling of the former coroner in April 1967 that the fire was more probably the result of human carelessness or malice is as accurate today as it was then, he wrote. Speaking with the New York Times in 2018, Mr. McEwen explained why Mr. Fogel's use of a certain piece of information in his argument that the Res Club fire was definitely an arson is misleading. The argument that the Res Club fire was an arson depends heavily on the findings of Philip Braid, a chemist in Ontario. He wrote to the police in New York saying that he had found traces of an accelerant in a piece of rug padding taken from the Res Club. This led to Ithaca Police Chief Herbert Van Ostrand announcing that all three fires set where FUDs were being housed including the fatal fire at the Res Club, were the result of arson. However, the state police lab had not found any traces of accelerant during their testing of samples from the Res Club. After Philip Braid reported his results, they retested their samples and again found no accelerant. The samples that had been sent to Ontario had been collected by an engineer retained by the insurer of the Res Club building. Mr. McEwen witnessed the engineer whom he described as a nut, collect these samples. He says the engineer collected the samples improperly and allowed different samples to commingle together. The non-fatal fires almost certainly were arson, as supported by the accelerant evidence found at those scenes. However, with the accelerant evidence from the Res Club called into question, there is a lack of definitive proof that the Res Club fire had been intentionally set. Mechanical factors were ruled out as potential causes of the fire early on, leaving the possibility of the Res Club fire being the result of arson open. However, the possibility that the fire had been accidentally set also remains open, without the results of the accelerant testing at the Res Club being definitive. While no new evidence about the Res Club fire has been discovered since 1967, the investigation remains open. Tompkins County District Attorney Matt Van Houten looked at the case file after he took office in 2017 and said in an interview that same year that he had not been the first DA to do so in the previous 50 years. We do know that the fire was of human origin. In other words, it was not a mechanical fire. There was nothing structural that caused the fire. It was caused by human negligence or intentional human conduct, he said in the same interview. Based on the initial investigation, which DA Van Houten believes was sound, four persons of interest in the case have been identified. However, according to DA Van Houten, there is no evidence that would raise them from a person of interest to a suspect. Three of the persons of interest are male, and one is female. They had all been members of the Accelerated PhD program. One of the persons of interest stood out over the others. Reportedly, the same individual, Bill Fogel, has identified as a strong suspect. None of these persons of interest have ever been identified publicly, in case evidence ever allows prosecutors to file charges against someone. But District Attorney Van Houten has also said that this will most likely not occur without a confession or a new witness coming forward. Cornell's class of 1967 installed a small plaque at the Res Club, listing the names of the victims of the fire, but it was not in a highly visible location and not placed there by Cornell. Those who knew the victims believed they deserved a more prominent memorial, and one from the university itself. Survivors of the Res Club fire did not believe Cornell itself had properly acknowledged and commemorated the fire, their experiences, and the nine lives that had been cut short. In August of 2018, a group of 13 survivors, along with three relatives of students killed in the fire, met with Cornell President Martha Pollack with specific requests to correct the failures of previous administrations. 
The group asked for a public apology on behalf of Cornell for its actions both before and after the fire, for the fire code violations and lack of required safety features in the res club, which contributed to the loss of life, and what they would later describe as a shocking lack of support offered by the university to the fire survivors, their families, and the families of the dead after the fire. They also asked for all available files about the fire and the subsequent investigation to be made available to them in full. It was also important that the victims of the fire be more fully and appropriately memorialized. They hoped for both a physical memorial on campus as well as living memorials in the form of nine annual scholarships, each named for a victim of the fire and awarded to a student who was in their same field of study. During the meeting, President Pollock suggested an annual lecture series with a lecture named after each victim as another possibility for a living memorial. A physical memorial to the victims of the fire would finally arrive on the Cornell campus in 2019. On October 4th, a memorial was dedicated to the victims of the fire. The memorial consists of nine boulders of local limestone, one for each victim, and a large bronze plaque. River birch was planted around it, creating what was described during the ceremony as an oasis for peaceful remembrance, where the memory of these nine Cornelians will endure. The memorial stands between Day Hall and Sage Memorial Chapel, where the memorial service for those lost in the fire had been held more than 52 years earlier. For too long, all of you have felt unheard and your memories unacknowledged, Cornell President Martha Pollock said in a speech at the dedication, addressing the survivors of the fire and the loved ones of the victims. No one can take away the pain of what you experienced, but what we can do is hear your stories and become the custodians of your memories with this memorial, which will remain here in the heart of campus as long as the university stands. There may never be enough evidence to show if the Res Club fire was a deliberate arson or a tragic accident. Even if it is proven to be the result of arson, the perpetrator may never be brought to justice or even definitively identified. While the mystery and controversy may forever endure at Cornell, more importantly, so will the memories of the nine people lost in the fire. While the mystery and controversy may forever endure at Cornell, more importantly, so will the memories of the nine people lost in the fire. <laughs>